All right, I think we're live. Push one in the chat if you can hear me. All right, got a confirmation from the chat. Thank you for that confirmation. Welcome back to the Black Brain Trust. This is episode 571, Black Economics. Please hit the like button as you come in, share the video if possible, and hit that notification bell so you get all the updates from the Black Brain Trust, including those posted on the community tab. There's a doc in the description beneath the video for you to follow along with. If you want to engage in this discussion, there'll be a link in the chat for you to click on. When you click on the link, make sure you raise your hand so that one of us can acknowledge you and advance you to the panel. Just as an FYI, we are not certified financial planners. If you want to certify financial planner, go to cfp.net and look up one of your area. All views and opinions are expressed by the panel members and not a representative of the Black Brain Trust. So we can get started with the first item on the docket. Let me give a shout out to people who showed up, man. Um, Excalibur salute, Super Triz, what it do. Isaac of Olympia, peace. Engineering Cannabis, peace. Milton T. Jackson, what up? Nick Penn, we in here. Yes, sir. All right. All right, first item on the docket is from Business Insider. Adidas employees say a fragmented leadership is perpetuating a culture of systemic racism at the company with limited black representation inside and a general dismissal of a global problem. Julia Bond was only a few months into the full-time designing job at Adidas when she expected experienced a brush with racism at the company. A t-shirt design featuring a Confederate flag was approved and sent on a mood board to her team for design inspiration. Bond said that the design remained on the wall for weeks before anyone, including her, noticed it was there. I wasn't planning on having a visceral reaction, but I couldn't help but cry. Bond, who is a Black woman, told Business Insider, she took a few days off and met with human resource representatives to explain what happened, she said. And Adidas representative said that the image was removed immediately after the design team was made aware of the incident and an apology was issued to Bond and her team. But to Bond, the damage was already done. And it, it's incidents like these that Adidas is working to stop. But employees say that leadership in the, in the company's German headquarters are impeding the change that many US-based employees are fighting for by dismissing the issue of racism as a problem that only exists in America. Business Insider uh, spoke to five current Adidas employees located in offices in North America and Germany, three of whom cited issues of upward advancement for black people at the company. In two cases, Business Insider granted anonymity to allow them to speak more frankly about their experiences with Adidas. In these cases, Business Insider verified their identities. 
or the five current employees that Business Insider spoke to said that they believe a disconnect between Adidas American and German leadership impedes the company's ability to fully address what they describe as racism within the company. A former Adidas employee who worked in the UK office until 2019 and a current employee in the North America uh, both cited feeling tokenized by colleagues for their black skin color. Some Adidas employees with bond at the league have been protesting since June 5th and speaking up about what they describe as an uncomfortable and problematic environment for people of color at the athletic wear giant in a lackluster response to the current situation in the U.S. In the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd and protests that spread across America, a 13-member coalition representing over 100 employees from the company's North American and German headquarters on June 2nd sent a 32-page deck to North American leadership titled our state of emergency, which outlined a series of requests to, and, uh, to recognize and respond to racial injustice with hard deadlines for each. A day later in a June 3rd email to Adidas North American leadership that she shared with Business Insider, Bond described her experience with that, uh, with what she called systemic racism in the company. My, my existence at this brand is praised as diversity and inclusion, but when I look around, I see no one above or around that looks like me, Vaughn wrote in the email. I can no longer stand for Adidas consistent complacency, a consistent complacency in uh, taking active steps against a racist work environment. Adidas six person executive board is entirely white and its 16 person supervisory board is mostly white as well. And black employees from the company's North American headquarters in Portland, Oregon, said the company's workplace contradicts the brand's diverse and inclusive image. The New York Times previously reported. The report said that fewer than 4.5% of 1,700 Adidas employees at the Portland, Oregon campus identified as Black, according to internal employment figures from last summer. In contrast, marketing campaigns and celebrity partnerships from Adidas are known to from, uh, prominently feature artists and athletes of color, such as Beyonce, Kanye West, and James Harden. Then on June 7th, an Adidas employee named Eric Armin took to Instagram to share his, the story of what he described as a white colleague calling him a version of the N-word. Adidas later joined many other companies in making commitments to being more proactive on race. Nike has uh, pledged a two to one match for employee donations to organizations that help advance equality. McDonald's held a meeting with black franchise groups to address racial uh, divides both within and outside the company. And Glossier announced it would donate $500,000 to Black Lives Matter, <laughs> the NAACP legal defense and other funds as well as an additional $500,000 in grants to black owned beauty businesses. So if you all want to know where Black Lives Matter is getting their money from, here it is. Okay, half a million dollars just went to Black Lives Matter. For its part, Adidas announced a three-step plan for change, which included a multi-million dollar investment into Black communities uh, in America over the next four years. Investments in university scholarships for Black employees and a commitment to filing or sorry, filling 30% of all new positions in the U.S. with Black and Latino, Latinx uh, people. In 2019, however, employees say Adidas management seemed to dismiss racism as a problem confined to North America and not something the German leadership needs to address head on. On August 19, 2019, Aaron True, or oh, sorry, Aaron Tour a product manager for the Adidas owned Reebok was one of the many employees in attendance at an all, uh, all hands meeting for Reebok employees, which included top leadership from Adidas board and CEO Casper Worsted. One of the questions that was presented at the meeting centered on the topic of racism within the, the Adidas group. The question was answered by Karen Parkin and Adidas executive board member based in Germany uh, responsible for global human resources. Tour 
said that Parkin's response is something he can never forget. I hate that I, I'm I hate that I, I am unable to accurately uh, quote her word for word, but from my memory, I recall her response to be along the following lines. This is noise we only hear in North America. I do not believe there is an issue. So I do not feel the need to address this question. True uh, to our uh, Tory, sorry, to our wrote in an email to address leadership describing the incident. Another Adidas employee also described Parkin using the word noise to describe the racism problem in the US in a public post on LinkedIn. Adidas has not confirmed Parkin's original wording in this meeting and Parkin did not return Business Insights request for comment. This very situation shines light on the very problem we have in this company. Tor wrote in his email to Adidas leadership sent nearly a year after Worsted and Parkin addressed the company which also described his experience as a black employee at the meeting and at the company in general. The predominantly white board, SLT and corporate communication team executed uh, their power to hide what could shine light onto the deeply hidden and systemic, uh, systematic issues of our company. One being that our very head of uh, HR denounces the experienced racist problems and silence, uh, silences our voices. Tour, who is based in Massachusetts, said that while the U.S. seems to recognize racism as a serious issue in the company, the leadership team in Germany seems reluctant to do the same. In a court's report, one anonymous employee in, the leaders, in senior leadership re, uh, reportedly attributed inaction on racism and discrimination complaints at Adidas to Parkin and Worsted, describing the pair as the two most powerful figures in the company. They are the ones that are ultimately going to approve or deny anything, the employee told courts. Adidas reportedly disrupted, or sorry, disputed the, this characterization of its senior leadership. Uh, Worsted did not return Business Insider's request for comment. A current employee, sorry, a current corporate, uh, uh, a current corporate employee is an Adidas Portland office also cited a disconnect among American and German leadership in regards to racism. The messaging from Germany has long been that this is a U.S. problem, said the employee who requested an enemy to speak more frankly about the situation at Adidas. This employee who identifies as Black and has been with the company for three years said the, com said the conversations with his German colleagues have made it clear that racism is not viewed with the same gravity uh, abroad as it is in the U.S. There's just a pretty big disconnect between the global and local companies, he added. This disconnect was highlighted in a June 4 German headquarters meeting entitled United Against Racism, which an employee in attendance said was led by Torben Schumacher, the general manager of, uh, of Adidas Originals. During the meeting, a handful of black employees from the Portland office were given the chance to publicly recount their personal experiences with racism at Adidas. According to Olivia Petroni, an Adidas designer in Germany who attended. Petroni, who identifies as a white woman, told Business Insider the move toward open conversation about internal racism during this meeting was a big step for the company but she felt that a proper acknowledgement of the problem from leadership was lacking, especially from Schumacher who ran the meeting. He very much isolated it to being a US only problem, Petroni uh, said of Schumacher's discussion of racism in the meeting. Schumacher did not return business side of the request for a comment. In response to a request uh, for comment regarding the uh, alleged disparity between the messaging from US and German leadership about Racism and Adidas spokesman, a spokesperson, referred to Business Insider to a June 5th company statement that read racism is an issue that exists not only in the US but in all uh, countries. We all want to see justice, action, peace, and most importantly, progress. As a global sports company, Adidas is committed to creating change. The spokesperson added that the company's leadership stands with this statement. Regardless of location or nationality and that Adidas leadership team includes people of multiple nationalities. Another German office employee who identifies as a non-white female 
also told Business Insider that she felt the issue of racism was only being addressed in the U.S. In regards to Adidas' June 5th statement, this employee said, as with any public statement, the language of their action plan and commitments is very intentional. If you compare it to the previous statements about diversity and inclusion, the U.S. focus is evident. So yeah, you know, I don't wear Adidas. Um, I don't support them. I've always known that this was an issue uh, within the company since I know people who work in that part of the industry. So um, same thing with Nike, same thing with Converse. These, these are very, and I think it's unfair to blame the company itself. The physical company that's listed on the stock exchange is not the problem. It's the people within the company that make the um, culture what it is. And so I don't, like I said, I don't support Adidas. I, I don't have any sort of um, stake in, 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 uh, in, in any sort of products or anything like that. But this is, this story, you know, you can replace Adidas with any other comp uh, company in this country um, from a black perspective and, and see that this is a, a massive issue um, across multiple companies. Why they're trying to deny that any of this is even happening, especially coming from Germany. I mean, you would think that Germany would be this sort of uh, socialist, progressive um, sort of state within the European Union. And apparently that's not the case, okay? Apparently that's not the case. So I feel for those people who work for that company because if you don't have anybody to go to, man, that could be very stressful. Some of these people have already left the company now. So I'm just pointing out the fact that, um, you know, people in the manosphere, black manosphere, don't understand this, the impact of racism on, on, on the victims uh, within these organizations, especially if they don't have a broad social network. It sucks. Okay, It really sucks. And there are a lot of people who would deny that, oh man, there's no such thing as racism in these companies. You, you should just stop, you know, stop uh, being a snowflake, stop complaining. Everybody who's black sees it in these organizations, okay? Everybody does. These companies are turning mega profit off of the backs of black people, black men mostly in, in terms of sports, okay? The NBA, um, you know, which, which, which is a lucrative cash, cash cow for Adidas, um, you're not seeing the, uh, although you see the figures like James Harden, the thick beard and all the um, phenotypical features, that's not in the leadership <laughs> at Adidas. That's not, I'm surprised James Harden hasn't come out and said anything about this, you know? Uh, or maybe there's something in, uh, um, there's a clause in his uh, contract that says he can't speak out about it. But the point of the matter here is Adidas, like many of these companies, are all guilty of this. They don't want to do anything about it. They don't see a problem. You just need to shut up and deal with it. Okay? That's, a, that's abuse. Abuse of power. It's abuse of power. There's no reason to treat people like this in your organization. Why did you even hire them in the first place? Uh, if you were going to treat them that way, um, what's interesting is that you don't hear you don't hear about this problem being um, uh, labored against, uh, you know, like Jewish people or something like that. It, it's only black people that they seem to have a problem with. Even even in America, they just seem to have a problem with them. And, and keep in mind, Adidas is a German company. Okay, less than five percent, four percent of their staff is actually a, a, a African American or black or consider themselves to be black. This is a big problem because a good, a good uh, portion of their um, their customer base is probably above one third. You're talking way over thirty five percent of their of their customer base is, is that uh, uh, black uh, identity, and they have a lot of audacity to you know to stand up here and say, "Well, we don't see a problem here. That's an American issue." Yeah, right. You're a global brand. You're a multinational brand. Why wouldn't you? Uh, look more into this. You see, the thing is, white people, Mazungas, 
don't want a necessary mechanism in place to deal with racism. They want to maintain it. They want to keep going with it. And they, they don't care about the laws, okay? Or at least they don't care about the blowback, so to speak. They're going to keep doing it till somebody who's strong enough to stand to, to stand up to the uh, uh, company from an institutional perspective um, comes in there and starts cracking heads. The only real way to fix this problem is to treat it like a Me Too issue, okay? Treat it like sexual assault. This shows up on your criminal record. If you're a white person and you're engaging in racism against black people in this country, you will be punished in a way so severe, it'll make your fucking head spin until it comes pops off your fucking shoulders, okay? You would have to register as an offender. There'll be an Amber Alert that goes out every time you move to a certain location. There's a racist person in your neighborhood. You should be aware of this, okay? There should be a, um, you know, a, your, your face plastered inside of a, uh, um, a, a library or something like that that says, hey, you know, this person is in your neighborhood, okay? Th these are the type of people in your neighborhood right now. They should change their license plates. Make sure they have like a yellow license plate so that we can identify who these people are. Hey, that, that's a racist guy. You know, you, you might not want to... Uh, you know, uh, uh, pass him on the left or something like that. Okay, you might you might not want to park your car next to his or hers. That's the only real way to 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 actually address this issue. Not not this other you know pity patty shit. With me too. A woman who may not even be the victim, or a person who may not even be the victim, can speak on behalf of what they consider to be the victim, and that person is a uh, is anonymous. And you don't, and, and if if they accuse you of that, you won't know who the person is accusing you of it. Okay, you can be charged or brought up on charges based on sexual assault, and it doesn't have to be true. As long as long as they can stick something to you, that's fine. But when it comes to racism, people are like, oh, I don't know, it's not really that big of an issue. You should get over it. You know, businesses are here to make money. And, you know, if you don't like your job, then quit. That's the sort of response to racism. That's why you can't seem to address it. And this is coming from Black people in the manosphere. Okay, we've heard these people. I'm not going to mention their names. They come through these chats and they talk like this. That's pretty much who they are, man. They're aiding and abetting of racism in there against black people. They are the getaway car drivers for white supremacy in corporate America. And they hang around in the manosphere, they're hanging around these chats, they got blue wrenches, blue yetis. There's not that much difference between Black Lives Matter and some of these people in the manosphere. You know, they, you know, BLM, they have some rainbow colors there. Well, in the manosphere, some of these guys got blue wrenches and blue yetis. Do I consider those people to be no different than BLM? Rainbow colors on one side, blue colors on the other side. Okay? Not that much different. These people in our community who are aiding and abetting of racism against black people uh, are treasonous. They should be held accountable. There should be a tribunal. We should put these people on trial and we should prosecute them to the fullest extent of what the black community considers to be justice, man. You shouldn't be able to get away with that. You shouldn't be able to aid and embed of white supremacy within the community and sit on a, on, on a panel and collect super chats and cash apps, man. We're gonna put a stop to that this, this year. This summer, we're gonna put a stop to these people. You, you sit back and you watch. We have DE Raptor on the panel. Shalom DE.
shoot. What's going on? How you doing, Mike? Uh, and uh, shalom to the chat. Hey, uh, um, look, everybody that does the same thing follows the American lead, follows the British lead. Um, if you, it, I've never heard of any athlete who, when he sits down and signs a, a Nike or Puma or Adidas contract, asks how many employees of African descent, how many black employees do you have? You know, what position are they in the company? None of that happens. So the company is just following American lead. If you walk into Microsoft, that's what you see. You walk into, I don't know, Facebook, that's what you see. You walk into IBM, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, uh, you know, especially Coca-Cola, Pepsi. We are soft. We drink more sodas than, than we drink water, you know. And this is all over the world, all over the planet. In some places in Africa, you will see a, a, a Coca-Cola and a Pepsi uh, sign. They sell it all over the continent. So you, you're getting a leadership from, from the U.S. that's being followed by the rest of the world. And the thing is that the EU has the same laws as the U.S., you know, against racism and all that. But when you bring one of these things to court, nothing happens. So it's like people say, you know what? Let me make my money, and and then uh, 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 a lot of employees. You, you got you, you when you're in there and you're in a position of uh, I don't know. Suppose you are. Uh, supervisor or VP somewhere. You know that that position is there as a kind of like a token. So you might not be tempted to say anything until you get asked a question. Even when you ask a question, you play it down. So that's the way it's, that's the way this thing works. You know, it's only when you see articles like this and they come every they come occasionally, especially in the circumstances that we are in now. You see articles like this. But after the circumstances get played out, the new cycle is gone, is back to uh, the, the, the standard procedures. So it's, it's like nobody stays with their foot on these people's neck, you know, and until that happens, Nothing's going to change. And the changes that, well, I can't say the change that you see, because you know, me, I don't, the only change I see coming is, is, is what black people really don't want. You know, we don't want to take responsibility for our lives. And that's, that's what I see. Serious. We want to follow somebody else. So no matter what happens, we, we look at ourselves as being survivors. You know, you know, we survived this, we survived that, we survived it. But if you're doing all you're doing is just barely surviving, guess what? You're not living. So it's it's, it's like we don't want to get up. You know what I'm saying? Because then we, we can't, we have to give up that, um, that, that, that victim, chief victim badge that we were, you know? So this thing will stop when we make it stop. And we can't make it stop on this. Every once in a while, something starts, like in the, in the 70s. When, when, well, not 70s, but say the 60s. When, Black people really start to say, you know what, stand up, let's stand up because now we got something to fight for. This is our right. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, all those people are gone. And guess what happened? 
we we come up with it with this um thing about we the sheep and we're gonna sit down with the wolf and we're gonna play with the wolf. That's a bunch of crap. I never seen a sheep sit down beside a wolf and get eaten yet. So <laughs> it we are about to get eaten. And if people don't believe that, just wait a few years and see. Well the thing is that um the, the reason why it doesn't ever get any traction is because there's an unwillingness um, for a coalition of, uh, of Black people, man. This, this, I mean, people speak out in these articles, I, I understand that. There should be a national, you know, chamber uh, uh, against, you know, this type of stuff, man. Um, I, I don't understand we have like the uh, NAACP and whatnot. Those institutions are not effective. This same company who has massive levels of racism in it, this gave $500,000 to Black Lives Matter. So if anybody wants to know where Black Lives Matter is getting all their money, here it is. They just got a half a million dollars, a half a billion dollars. I'm sorry, a half a million dollars. And that's, that's the standard procedure. Yeah. You know, when they get pointed out, when somebody points out to them something that's wrong, says, you know what, they have this, they call in the lawyer and the lawyer says, you know, uh, let me call somebody. So they call uh, one of the local civil rights leaders and who's in their pocket. And he said, well, you know what? Yeah, donate to a good organization. And that's it. That's what black advisors tell them to do. And they do it. It's not that they, they have this brainstorm on the best thing to do or not. Nope. Mm -hmm. They call their guy. It's like when you see the the rebellion come up from all the policemen shooting. They call their guy and says, hey, what's happening in the streets? And he goes down, stands to the side and says, hey, uh, yeah, this is what's happening. He said, we need you to go out there and talk to these people and calm things down. That's what he does. He goes out, calm things down. He gets, he gets his pay. Mm -hmm. People well, go back to doing the norm things, get killed. This should have been a massive campaign against Adidas to, to just boycott them and divest from them okay, by black people. They should have been a massive campaign to, to just remove them from the um, uh, 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 um, from the community as a whole, all the staples and whatnot that they have. <clears throat> What's going on, MLT? What's going on, man? Chill, man. I, I just don't get it with these type of organizations, man. And it just goes to show you that you really can't trust people within this society who bring this level of thinking that they're part of some community or that they're our counterpart within society. Mm -hmm. You see what happened when they get power. They focus on everything else but the boys and the goddamn men. They do it every single time. This is the last time, though. Mm -hmm. uh, they ain't going to be able to get, with, get away with this shit again. Nope. Because because all these people are deliberately and specifically silent because of it. I mean, this is a track record. These are court cases. Stuff can be easily be looked up. But I don't know, man. It's sometimes I get disheartening. But but for me, it's just confirmation bias. This builds up for me to just get my stuff more together so that way I don't have to worry about these type of things to build my own power for myself. So. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a fact. That's a fact. I mean, see, M M -O -T, if, if we don't have anything, it's like we, you got people who will pay a, 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 a two or three hundred dollars for a pair of Jordan for their son and don't pay the electric bill. You know, don't buy books for their kids to, to read. Don't send their kids to school. Don't, don't go down to the, the school, the school <clears throat> that the school and the school discussing what's going on. You know, how you, you this, this is this is ridiculous. I see people, shoot, the, what do they call it? Black Friday, they call it? Fighting yeah. over this stuff. Yeah. Fighting over a pair of sneakers, man. You know, fighting over a, a, a Adidas shirt, NBA shirt. Yeah, let me, let me move to the next article. Um, this is from yahoonews.com 
Billionaire Robin F. Smith launches new initiative to ease student debt at historically black colleges. Robin F. Smith, the billionaire who pledged during a commencement uh, speech last year to pay off the student debt at the Morehouse College uh, class of 2019 is launching a new initiative to help ease the burden of student loans at historically black colleges and universities. The Student Freedom Initiative, a nonprofit, is aimed at addressing the disproportionate loan burden on black students and creating more choices for students whose career options or further educational opportunities might be limited by heavy student debt. You think about these students graduating and then plowing so much of their wealth opportunity into supporting this student debt. That's a travesty in and of itself. Smith, chairman and CEO of Vista Equity Partners, said Tuesday during a Time 100 talks uh, discussion with editor-in-chief Edward uh, Falesenko. Smith, the wealthiest black man in the United States, according to Forbes, donated $34 million last year that covered the student debt of about 400 Morehouse graduates, including the educational debt incurred by their families. He says his new initiative is an effort to create a more sustainable model for thousands more students. I think it's important that we do these things at a scale and in a mass because that's how you lift up and that's how you lift up communities, he says. Interesting. Of course, we all like the great one story, but I want thousands of these stories. And I want thousands of Robert Smiths out there who are actually looking to do things, uh, do some things in the fields that uh, are exciting to them and giving and are giving back. The Student Freedom Initiative will launch in fall 2021 at up to 11 HBCUs, offering juniors and seniors who are science, technology, engineering, and mathematics majors a flexible, lower risk and uh, alternative to high interest private loans. The list of HBCU participating uh, in the initial role has not been finalized. The initiative, which aims to include 5,000 new students each year, is launching with a $50 million grant from Fund to uh, Foundation, a charitable organization of which Smith is uh, founding uh, director and president and has set goal, set a goal of raising at least $500 million by October to make the program self-sustaining through investments and graduate become uh, income-based repayments. The program's partners include Michael Lomax, uh, CEO of United Legal Cards Fund, Henry Louis Gates Jr., director of the Hutchins Center for African and African American uh, Research at Harvard, the Jane Family Institute, and the Family Education uh, in the Education Finance Institute. The student debt crisis has disproportionately affected Black students who owe, on average, $7,400 more than their white peers after graduating with a bachelor's degree, according to the Brookings Institution. The difference is, that difference worsens all the time, in part because of the racial wealth gap. In addition, HBCUs generally have smaller endowments than other universities, hindering their ability to offer significant financial aid, and students who attend HBCU borrow loans at higher rates and graduate and graduate with higher debt than students at non-HBCUs, according to a 2016 report by the United Legal College Fund. But HBCUs remain an important professional pipeline. While African Americans are underrepresented in the STEM fields, HBCUs which represent 3% of colleges are responsible for, of, uh, for graduating 27% of black students with STEM bachelor's degrees, according to the US uh, Education Department. <laughs> Ultimately, Smith hopes to expand the Student Freedom Initiative to reach the more than 100 HBCUs in the US as well as other minority serving institutions. We can guarantee, we can graduate all STEM students from HBCUs in essence forever under this program. It becomes self-sustaining, Smith says. They support the next generation of students and it gives them flexibility to actually drive, uh, drive back some of what I call their intellectual property, what they learn in college and business back to the communities in ways that matter. The program is not intended to replace. Sorry, the, pro the program is not intended to replace all student loans or erase existing debt from students 
uh, freshman to or sophomore years, but is meant to provide an alternative to high interest fixed fixed payment private loans and parent plus loans, which are unsubsidized federal loans with high interest rates and fees. HBCU uh, students are more likely than non-HBCU students to take out federal student loans and then turn to parent plus loans and private uh, loans for additional funding, according to the United Negro College Fund report. The Student Freedom Initiative aims to prevent that and expects to offer about $32,000 on average to each student across their junior and senior years. Yeah, this is a pretty dope idea. Um, Hmm. We have uh, complex design and perfect blackness on the panel. What's going on, man? What do you do, Mike? Show sure, man. Yeah, man. I was able to uh, get off a little earlier today, so I can uh, shit join our live stream. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I'm gonna just listen in. I'll get in on the next article. Yeah. You know, Mike, I, I was hoping that I see a long list of other black entrepreneurs and sports people. I'm asking myself, you know, like, where's uh, uh, my brother with the cigar, you know, <laughs> and uh, the music moguls and the, 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 the I don't know. <laughs> Just, I was asking myself, you know, where are those people? Where are those names up there? People who should be saying, you know what? I'm in on this. Yeah. And I don't see no names. No, this isn't um <clears throat> this isn't a um this isn't a sexy business proposition. You know? Um this is this is a this is a, a noble business proposition. Right? This is more of a selfless you know, you don't really do this for the notoriety. Um, I think noble acts should receive notoriety, right? And I think that's really the the reason why uh, uh, Robert Smith uh, would, would get this type of coverage for it. I think the people that we're typically assigning as our our culture leaders and our thought leaders and all that kind of shit, they're in the position to more or less be the not for the, for the notoriety. It's not for the noble acts. Yeah, but the thing is, um, I think it's interesting how he, he framed it that, um, you know, I'm speaking of Robert F. Smith, that th this is how you this is how you fix uh, the black community um, and start removing a lot of that debt and, uh, and actually allowing them to have more uh, flexibility uh, to invest in their ventures. Um, I don't understand why the government doesn't see the value in this. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, because Mike, um, a lot of a lot of our economy is is you know it's a debt economy. It's a debt driven economy, right? So there's a business in all levels of debt. Um, there's there's so there's the student loan debt side of things, and there's a whole entire business uh, ecosystem that that supports. And if we take a class of people out of that, then we kind of we're moving them out of like the, the, the financial markets, if you will, right? And certain debt industries, because they're not holding that kind of debt. So it allows them that we understand it to be, to be uh, a, a, like, kind of like a net positive. We can get out here, you can get out of college and you're not, you're not saddled by a debt burden, okay? Um, you know how much of a head start you have? And also, do you know how much of a, a, a customer you're not to the financial markets in a lot of ways. So the whole idea is to kind of ensnare you into the whole, the, the debt markets uh, at, at, at the college level. So that you're in it once you move into the professional ranks and then you go on into uh, retirement and all that. And you have to factor in this debt load that you carry the whole way. So removing that shit or moving a good portion of it at the jump, Man, it, it does. It, 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 I can see how it puts us on a, on a, a course, charts us on a different course, man. All right, let me um, jump to the next item on the docket.
All right, this is from thefool.com. Got $5,000 and invest, in, invest it in these four stocks to get rich. Over the past four months, Wall Street investors have been exposed to about a decade's worth of volatility. The CBOE Volatility Index, also known as the FAIR Index, hit an all-time high during March with the benchmark S&P 500 losing 34% of its value in less than five weeks. But in the 11 weeks that followed, the S&P 500 bounced more than 40% off of its lows and got within the site of its uh, all-time high. If investors have learned anything from the recent volatility other than the fact that there are still plenty of unknowns surrounding the coronavirus disease 2019 pandemic, it's the benefits of long-term investing. While panic selling uh, can take immense uh, financial and psychological toll on short-term traders, it's not even a concern for investors with a long-term mindset and a focus on game-changing businesses. Best of all, periods of heightened uh, volatility and panic selling have historically proved to be an excellent opportunity to put money to work. If you have, say, $5,000 in disposable cash that won't be needed to pay bills or to cover emergencies, then you have more than enough capital to get rich by investing the following four stocks. Pinterest. Okay, we know what Pinterest is. Although the social media uh, space is dominated by Facebook and is increasingly difficult to get right from a business perspective, Pinterest looks to have the tools to offer its shareholders Facebook-like returns over the next decade. Interesting. Pinterest? Yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting that you people forget about Pinterest. Um, I have the app, but it, it, it's not really as engaging as let's say IG, but it does serve a purpose though. It does serve a, a very good purpose. Um, Green Thumb Industries, despite being one of the hottest investments on Wall Street for much of 2010s, marijuana stocks were a dumpster fire for final, final nine months of 2019. Green Thumb Industries included. However, as we weed out, quote unquote, the haves from the have-nots, it's becoming clear that the U.S.-based multi-state operator, Green Thumb, is on the uh, right path and in much better shape than most U.S. pot stocks. Are you familiar with uh, Green Thumb Industries uh, Complex? Green Thumb Industries? Um, not particularly. I'd have to see like what, the, who, what brands or what markets they're in. Okay. Um, but Green Thumb Industries, no. Okay. Kirkland Lake Gold. No, your eyes aren't deceiving you. Kirkland Lake Gold is indeed a gold mining stock that you should strongly consider buying due to its superior balance sheet and incredible production metrics. At least part of the story behind why gold miners like Kirkland Lake are so attractive ties into the underlying metal they produce. Physical gold is within a stone throw of a fresh seven year high and is likely to benefit from ongoing fear and uncertainty tied to COVID to the COVID-19 pandemic. In particular, the Federal Reserve pledging to keep its federal funds rate at an all-time low of 0% to 0.25% paves the way uh, for physical gold prices to head higher. With the Fed uh, liberally increasing the money supply via quantitative easing and bond rates yielding virtually nothing after inflation is accounted for, Physical gold becomes a go-to choice as a stock of uh, as a store of value for the foreseeable future. Never heard of them. Uh, not really familiar with them. So, yeah, I never heard of them either. Berkshire Hathaway. If I told you there was a stock that has returned an average of twenty point three percent annually to shareholders over the past fifty-five years, which is more than double the average. Uh, the annual average return of the S&P 500, inclusive of dividends, you must think I'd be talking about uh, some high growth tech sector, or sorry, tech stock, or perhaps an innovative uh, healthcare company. But the company in question is none other than Warren Buffett's own Berkshire Hathaway. One thing investors uh, get when buying into Berkshire Hathaway is Warren Buffett as a portfolio manager, even though 
he's given up some control over the company's $137 billion war chest to his investing lieutenants, the Oracle of Omaha can still pick a bargain. For instance, he made over $45 billion in unrealized gains plus dividends from his company's large holding in Apple. Dude, un unrealized gains? Like, like, like by accident? Yeah, he just kind of woke up one morning. Like, well, up. like, like, whoa, like, wait, wait, wait where did this $45 billion come from? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you just, like, that's some shit, dude. Like, where you unintentionally made an extra $45 billion, dude. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, just rolled out of the bed. His Crocs were on the floor, put him on. Oh, these are unrealized. That's really just money that they've earned but they just conveniently forgot or hey i didn't know that i even made this or I was, yeah. and uh, they they report it later on well i think i think also there there may be there may be some things like uh let's just say that within those portfolios let's say if there were some acquisitions that took place and there were there were um like there were stock swaps involved right so when there were splits that occurred like okay you didn't really intend maybe like a year or two prior you didn't maybe foresee that right so it may not have been something that you forecasted so i could see how some like like an unintentional gain through something like an acquisition that you didn't foresee um taking place i was just staggered by the amount by the amount that's what that's what caught me trust me there's nothing unrealized about that money trust me it, it could be just like the manuscript, you know, just unrealized super chats, you know, just sit mm -hmm. in, uh, <laughs> sitting in people's uh staff, <laughs> you know. I didn't know. I didn't know I had this many super chats, you know, just sitting there. I didn't cash all, all, them, all them super chats they didn't read. Yeah. Yeah. Tariq Machine. So oh, boy. Twenty thousand dollars in uh super chats just sitting there. Didn't even know they were there. He didn't know <laughs> that one. Something like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Unrealized gains actually, they hold a stock. They didn't sell it. They know that they got it if they sell it. That's what it is. But it's uh, it's money that's in it's it's unless the market goes down, then that's the money they have. Yeah, but what about what about swaps and splits? Well, you get you get all that through swaps and splits. That you might buy a right. stock at, at fifty, and it goes up to hundred, and then the companies, you know, do a two for one, and then you you your um, if it goes back up to fifty, unless you sell the stock. When you sell the stock, then you got to to to, to kind of declare what your gains are, at least to the government. Mm -hmm. The SEC right. knows all about that, but if you just holding on to the stock, it's like a long term um, buy, or suppose you buy a majority stake in the, in, in the company, then your gains are unrealized until you sell it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, look at this ad right here. What what are the chances that this? Wait a minute! I, I was just looking at that, Mike. Yeah, what are the chances this ad will pop up, man? Uh, and Doctor Phoenix is in the chat. <laughs> and Nagon is in the chat. Please. Oh shit! <laughs> People with money, zero real money. Point zero percent financing, bro. Zero point zero percent. Up to seventy-two months, man. No, no, no interest for the first seventy-two months. No payments for ninety days. And no payments for so so for the ninety days. You make no payments, and then for the first seventy-two months, no interest. You're paying principal. Yeah. Uh, wow. I'm still gonna wait till next year when the price of the car comes down from eighty thousand to forty or thirty. You know? What's up, fellas? What's going on, guys? Yo, what's up? Man? Yeah, yeah. Zero interest, huh? Okay. Zero interest. Yes. Yeah, so we'll seven stuff. years to pay, bro. You can seven, get a thirty-year mortgage on that, you know, California. Yeah, I, I, I mean, yeah. Well, they can afford to give you that because they're making so much money and in interest on this thing over the down down the line. They are, uh, they're, they're making a lot of money. They're making a lot of money on this on, on the interest side. The banks making. Yeah, the, 
Yeah, the rumors are, you know, Infinity may not be around in the next couple of years, so we don't know. Um, yeah, I was hearing that too. I was going to say, Mike, you hear about that. Yeah. yeah. You won't be around. You won't be around next you year. You won't be around next year. <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess the company isn't turning profit like they like they should, man. Um, you know, Nissan is not going to hold on to them for very long. Uh, maybe because they don't see the viability in that market. Um, but that's a whole other uh, subject for another day. Um, this is from CNBC.com. Microsoft is permanently closing its retail stores. Imagine that. Microsoft on Friday announced it will permanently close its 83 store retail locations. It will instead focus on on its focus on its online uh, online store at Microsoft.com where customers can go for support, sales, training, and more. Microsoft said its retail team members will help on the website instead of in store. A Microsoft spokesperson told CNBC that all employees will have the opportunity to stay with the company. Our sales have grown online as our product portfolio has evolved to largely digital offerings and our talented team has proven success serving customers beyond any physical location. Microsoft Corporate Vice President David Porter said in the blog post, we are grateful to our Microsoft Store customers and we look forward to continuing to serve them online and with our retail sales team at Microsoft Corporate uh, locations. Shares of Microsoft closed down 2% on Friday. In the past decade or so, Microsoft began to expand its retail presence in, in efforts to create a shopping experience similar to Apple's, where people could go to try a new Microsoft software and hardware created by both Microsoft and its partners. Microsoft even built a store on Facebook. Yeah, Microsoft even built a store on Facebook. In the past decade or so, Microsoft began to expand its retail presence in an effort to create a shopping experience similar to Apple's where people could go to try new Microsoft software and hardware created by both Microsoft and its partners. Microsoft even built a store on Fifth Avenue in New York City just blocks away from Apple's iconic Glass Cube store. The decision seems to be made after Microsoft decided to temporarily close its stores in March due to the spread of coronavirus. Microsoft said the closing of its physical locations will result in a pre-tax charge of approximately $450 million, which it will record in, it, in the current quarter that ends on June 30th. The charge includes primarily asset write-offs and impairments, the company said. Microsoft will continue to invest in its digital storefronts on Microsoft.com and stores in, in Xbox and Windows, which uh, reaching more than $1.2 billion, uh, sorry, 1.2 billion people every month in 190 markets. The company will also reimagine spaces that serve all customers, including operating Microsoft Experience Centers in London, NYC, Sydney, and Redmond campus locations. So, I think what's happening here is that um, they get in what they're getting is good. <laughs> I mean, if, if the pandemic is going to have things locked down like this, you know, for a considerable amount of months, let's say it goes into next year, does it really make sense to hold on to those stores with, with social distancing and whatnot? I don't not, Yeah, I was going to say not really because you can't. You, um, so you got a lot of these places that are now seeing these surges in Corona cases. So now they're shutting back down, right? You, how do you, how can you really just kind of long term, man, make any sort of predictions on anything, right? It, it, it's like, do you just kind of keep paying mortgage space for, um, uh, for, for large? Uh, I mean, these these places that that they have the stores at, they aren't cheap in terms of the mortgage what they're paying. So do you just continue to keep paying it? Yeah, you know, you know, when you really don't know, like when stuff's going to, quote unquote, go back to normal, you know, I'm looking at this from a different perspective or a somewhat a somewhat well additional to what you just said from an accounting point of view, that half a billion dollars is, mm -hmm. uh, oh man, that's a hell of a lot of money that they just made. Yep. You hear what I'm yeah. telling you? And when mm -hmm. I say made money, they made money. And people wouldn't understand that unless they know accounting. 
The second thing is that the production of their computer systems, their systems that they sell in the stores. Mike is always talking about how computers, you can't find computers in the stores now. So you, you got a building, you got an office somewhere where you're not making as much money as you're making online. Why are you keeping it open? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so people are not going to go back to that store. If, if you get it before, you might have had, you know, especially in New York City, depending on what location you're at, you might have a thousand people walking through the store a day. But now you have a hundred. Everybody else is going online. Right. You know, your computers are coming. You have to find another location to, to get your computers ready in Taiwan. Instead of mainland China, you know, you go to Taiwan or Malaysia or you know, somewhere else. So they are they are just making out like fat cats now. From what I see. Yeah. It, the thing is, um, they can easily reopen those stores inside their um inside their uh, corporate facilities. It's kind of like Amazon does. Amazon has uh, Amazon Go stores in their, co in their corporate facility. So right on their campus, I should say. But they could, Microsoft could easily do the same thing and kind of preserve the store presence without actually uh, going uh, in, in, into uh, uh, Main Street markets. You know, they can just keep it right within their um, corporate facility. Um, I, I, I guess they see the long-term aspect of, about this. I, I will probably be in the same position as them um, uh, uh, decision-wise to actually just close them down. Um, yeah, I would say one other thing that they could probably look at to still keep a footprint is maybe like kiosk, you know, like like uh, you know sales and service kiosk in places like malls where they can they can reduce their real estate footprint but still keep their retail footprint to some extent. You know what I mean? Well, Microsoft's main you know bread and butter is their is their uh, you know their their uh, accessories, and so those accessories can be sold in Best Buy and whatnot. They don't really need to keep a kiosk open for that. The main purpose of the store was was, was to uh, have that human to human interaction. No, that's um, what I mean, and so that's why I'm like, if they want to maintain it, and if they want to maintain it while reducing that 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 real estate commitment, then maybe. And, and I mean, this is just an idea, you know, because mm -hmm. other, otherwise they go they go strictly the online or they go to just basically the phone support and chat support internet support route right where they say okay we're going to retain all our employees but basically they're all going to become support employees yeah you at and did the same thing didn't at last week make at and made the same announcement they're closing all the um oh really uh, stores and 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 i think it's a little over five thousand employees are gone yeah wait this is at and yeah, yeah was, Sprint is doing the same thing. I now, mean, are you talking? Are this is this their like their 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 uh, mobile uh, phone locations? Yep. Damn. Wow. Everybody is going away. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> mobile talk about closing all the Sprint stores as well. Yeah, all the Sprint stores. Just about, unless unless um um T-Mobile don't have a, a place in that location. They're, they're going. Fuck. Even some of the T-Mobile locations that I saw around where I live, they're close too. The one that's near me is open. Um. Yeah, then the Verizon. Uh, they're they're still open, but damn, damn. Okay. I mean, that's a lot of you. Really have some, that, those are, these are a lot of big businesses shutting down retail locations. Yeah, the, the writing's on the wall. Yeah, I mean, like, dude, that's why I'm kind of bugging. I'm like, well, wait a minute. That's Microsoft. Then you tell me AT&T. Dude, that's like the majors. That's all of them. Yeah. yeah. A lot of them are closing here, too. A whole bunch of them. In Chicago. What? Yeah. yeah. What's, what's closing in Chicago? Uh, Sprint is dead. Sprint is dead. Is, is gone. Um and, and um, some, because um, I have T-Mobile, and some T-Mobiles are closing as well. I don't even go to T-Mobile no more because a lot of them are closing so much. I'm just, I'm just doing everything online. I, I, yeah, I have Google Fi, so I, I don't go into a store. But um, right, 
it, it's very interesting. The sprint is gone. I haven't seen a sprint store here in a while. Damn. Yeah. Are you sure you're not talking about uh, um, Nextel? <laughs> you seen Nextel either. <laughs> Yeah, you might as well be talking about walkie talkie. Hey. Yeah. Next year, the, the, the legal master, man. You didn't know that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's this is unbelievable, man. This is, un- I mean, these are all the big players. Yeah, but that's also writing on the wall, too. Right. I, I think this no, COVID, I think this COVID exposed uh, uh, some serious vulnerabilities in the, at the very foundation of this economy. That's that's just been my, you know, uh, take on it. It yeah. just really exposed a lot of vulnerabilities of, of the economy. So we, some serious uh, fault line weaknesses, I think. Yeah, let me go to MarketWatch.com. Hertz stock soars after Jeffrey says Carmax automate automation may swoop in. Share Wait, hey, uh, hey, Mike, when, when is this article from? When is it from? June twenty fourth. June twenty fourth. Okay. Yeah, shares of Hertz Global Holdings, uh, Hertz shot up 20% in an active trade in Wednesday, putting them on track to a snap a four-day losing streak in which they plunged 38% after Jeffrey's analyst uh, Hamaz, uh, Hamza uh, Mazari said his cheek, uh, sorry, his checks uh, suggest that CarMax Incorporated, KMX and AutoNation include, uh, Incorporated and could be interested in the bankrupt car uh, car rental company. Trading volume uh, was 18.8 million shares, making the stock the the most actively traded on on New York Stock Exchange. Meanwhile, CarMax's stock gained 0.3%, while AutoNation fell, uh, shares fell 2.3%. Masri uh, said the most obvious way for auto dealers, CarMax and AutoNation, uh, to swoop in would be to bid for 150,000 of Hertz used cars, which are likely to be sold to pay off lenders. But also, as Hertz looks to reduce its fleet given the current demand and need to shore up cash, he believes a sale of 150,000 used cars could raise $3 billion. Separately, Masri said he believes the $1 billion in liquidity Hertz had on had as of uh, March 31st, will have dwindled to about $365 million by June 30th, next week. Which means the company needs debtor in, possess, uh, in possession, of, in pos- sorry, in, debtor in possession financing as of at least $900 million. We think the longer Hertz takes to reemerge from bankruptcy with a cl- cleaner uh, capital structure, the more opportunity there is for rivals to pick up share. Uh, Masri wrote in the store in a note to clients. So I've heard that um, Carvana was on the lookout for them as well. Um, even car gurus for that matter. I don't know. I'll tell you right now, um, and I, I will openly, clearly disclose what I'm doing with Hertz. A um, few weeks back after they announced the CHOP 11, and this is something I've been talking in the gone about for shit, maybe the last month. Okay, We've been talking back and forth about all this. Um, so I picked up some Hertz stock when it was at 83 cents. Uh, it ran all the way up to 690 at one point about two weeks ago. Um, then they started making the announcements in terms of chapter 11, like what they're going to be doing, what parts of the business is going to be affected. And the fleets was the first thing on the chopping block. So this doesn't surprise me. This news that you're talking about, like CarMax is an auto nation. Uh, and then maybe even a couple others. I could totally see Carvana coming in and poaching off some of that, that fleet also to bolster their business. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm seeing the stock do what it's doing just because of all of the chapter 11 wranglings that, that are going on. However, on the other side, I'm, I'm about to start positioning like the option side of things because I really am looking at Hertz being scooped up by a tech company after all of this, this drop off is done. 
I see them being scooped up by like a like a Uber or something like that. That's just me. Uh, and the disclaimer too, uh, we're not certified financial planners. I'm not like a stock analyst or no shit like that. I'm just giving you guys my analysis based on what's been going on with Hertz and reading this article. All right, let's go to the next item on the docket from Slate. Who cares if the IRS sent stimulus checks to dead people? This isn't the scandal journalists are making it out to be. So it turns out the federal government sent more than 1 million coronavirus relief payments to dead people. That's according to a report released Thursday by the Government Accountability Office, which earned some breathless uh, coverage from the Washington Post describing the revelation as a problem of astonishing scope. In fact, it's anything but. The IRS sent out more than 160 million economic impact payments worth $269.3 billion since Congress passed the CARES Act in March. Out of all those direct deposits, checks, and debit, and debit cards, the GAO says that $1.1 million or 0.4% of the total worth about $1.4 billion went to individuals who are deceased. We are quite literally talking about a rounding error that appears to have been the product of, of Washington's efforts to get money to Americans as quickly as possible in the middle of an economic and public health disaster. The Post writes, the report makes clear how in the mad dash to pass legislation to prop up an economy, in free fall, in the midst of an unpre unprecedented uh, pack, uh, pandemic, mistakes were made. But even calling this a mistake is a stretch, given that the alternative was to slow down the process of delivering much needed aid. So, although I agree that you know the the, the you know the mathematic, uh, the math behind it would be relatively. Um, minuscule in comparison to the massive ripoff that some of these other companies did uh, taking these uh, stimulus checks. I think this would have been better solved had they had UBI. Any discussion? I agree. Um... All right, this is from CNN.com. The recession is much worse than the IMF expected and the hit to jobs catastrophic. The International Monetary Fund has slashed its global economic forecast for 2020 saying the coronavirus pandemic is causing a much steeper recession and a slower recovery than initially expected. The organization said Wednesday that it thinks Global GDP will contract by 4.9% this year, downgrading its estimate from April when output was forecast to shrink by 3%. That was already due to the deepest slump since the Great Depression of the 1930s. The pandemic is causing an unprecedented decline in global activity, according to the IMF. It said the global labor market has taken a catastrophic hit. Uh, movement outside the home remains uh, depressed companies have cut back on investment and consumer spending has dropped significantly. The COVID-19 pandemic has had more negative impact on activity in the first half of the 2020 than anticipated and recovery is projected to be more gradual than previously forecast, the IMF said in the report. The outlook is slightly rosier than those provided by the World Bank and the organization for economic cooperation and development, which have recently forecast the global GDP could shrink by 5.2% and 6%, respectively, before rebounding in 2021. But the IMF warned of a higher than usual degree of uncertainty. Around its forecast, which it said was based on a number of assumptions, including stable financial conditions, and it pointed to the difficulty of, of charting the trajectory of the virus and measures to contain it, 
as well as the impact of vol uh, voluntary social distancing on spending, the consequences of new workplace safety measures and lingering unemployment. Though every region is expected to face a recession in 2020, there will be substantial differences across the individual economies, the IMF said. So right here is a chart of what's shrinking dramatically. You can see right here that what's in gray was in 2019 and what's in orange is um, what the projection is for 2020. China's not going to shrink by that much, if at all. Jeez. You know, we talked about China being cash positive. Um, a lot of people were questioning the legitimacy of, uh, of China um, ability to withstand this uh, recession. Uh, this projection proves um, our point from months ago that we, we had made. Um, India um, will take a setback. Nigeria will take a setback. Japan will take a setback. Uh, Russia will take a major haircut. Saudi Arabia, as usual, uh, Germany, South Africa, the United States. They won't just take a haircut, man. They're, they're going to catch that fade. You're going to catch that fade, bro. Yeah. Canada, Brazil, United Kingdom. Everyone is taking, the, um, is taking major haircuts, man. If not, you know, they're getting Mohawks out here. So and you notice, you know, and those are those are like your your developed first world nations the, when you notice those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is your G20. China, which got a head start in the recovery, expected to log growth of one percent, in part due to uh, policy support from the government. India's economy, meanwhile, is forecast to shrink four and a half percent following a longer lockdown and slower than expected recovery. The US economy is expected to shrink by 8% while output across 19, the 19 countries that use the Euro could decline by 10.2%. Countries in Latin America are still struggling to contain the, the virus will also be hard hit. Brazil's economy is expected to contract by 9.1% while output in Mexico could decline by 10.5%. The IMF expects the global economy to grow by 5.4% in 2021, still 6.5% percentage points below the pre-coronavirus projections. However, much uh, depends on ongoing stimulus support, the group said. So far, governments have announced nearly $11 trillion in fiscal measures per the IMF. So I don't know. Um, they're gonna, you know, the United States is gonna carry this all the way into uh, 2021. Okay, maybe that could, you know, for Microsoft, many of these companies, uh, AT and T, uh, what T-Mobile did to Sprint, they see the writing on the wall. Something is not, you know, you won't be around next year, like like uh, Nagon said, you won't be around next year. So it's a lot of these companies that. Um, are seeing that uh, instability is not going to be short term. It's going to be long term. Now, could they rebound back in 2021? Anything is possible, but with the social distancing and all, all of the uh, corona uh, uh, pandemic measures, I don't see how you can recover. I don't see how you can have an elevator inside of a building that has 20 floors and only two people can get on the fucking elevator. How, how are you going to do business that way? Or would they, everybody just take the stairs? Okay. You say so. Well, you need your temperature check before going in this facility. Um, you also got to change your mask here. You have to do this. You have to do that. I don't want to leave the house if I have to go through all that shit. This, yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah, this is worse than taking off your shoes and, and going to the, um, you know, the, the scanner in the airport. Okay. This is worse. This would be, be every day. This would be every day. Yeah. Into 2021 for the foreseeable future. So all for between now and, and this time, 2021, people will be living their life like this. People are putting things on hold. I, I may not want to get that 78 screen. I'm good, bro. I'm good with that. Yeah, I got to tell you, man, um, I, ha I have, you know, a few purchases planned. Um, not that I'm not planning to make them. I just had to really just kind of, you mm -hmm. know, 
take more of a cautious approach. You know, um, I had a, a sim racing rig that I was looking to purchase. Actually, I was looking to purchase it um, last month. You know, and I was just kind of like, man, let me let me just go ahead and I'm going to make sure I just got a little bit more reserve before I make that purchase. You know, I'm just a little more cautious on shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that new Xbox is coming out, new PlayStation coming out. Might want to put that on hold. Yeah, no, real shit. You got uh like Marcus Brownlee, he just reviewed the PS uh the new PS5. Uh I think it was like last week or something. You know, but I can't look, you think you're gonna really see people like sleeping out in front of like Best Buy and shit to go buy this stuff? Like you can't. <laughs> You literally can't do it. You won't be able to do it. Hey, uh, Complex, you want a better dinner on that? Uh, Black Friday, uh, <laughs> it's going to be online outside. If they're still, they're still open, if they're still open, then yeah, we'll see it. But I mean, no, just much, much like that. the... You won't, see any of no, you won't see any of that. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think so because if... Go ahead, Mike. No, I was going to say that Best Buy does not want to take on the liability of people being that closely uh, in contact. With exactly, you. exactly. I think they're gonna, I think they'll put the kibosh on all of it. I think all these retailers are gonna do it. Look, bro, I, I think Walmart, I, all of them. I drove by Best Buy the other day. I was I was gonna go look at a computer. And there were lines outside the store, people waiting to get the uh, temperature taken and questioned about their health. Waiting, nine. Yeah, no, Pop that's what, that happened to me last weekend. I went to an Apple store uh, okay. just to go get a little replacement piece for uh, a little Apple pencil. And yeah, there's two lines, right? And those are people who got your, their appointments. They go in, then you have the two lines. And then, yeah, they, they require a face covering and then they take your temperature and then they'll help you. <laughs> they'll, they help you after they take your temperature, basically. Yes. Hey, what's people, up, everyone? People are gonna do what they want to do, man. If they're allowed, if, if the, unless even when the government tell you, look, we don't want you to do this thing for the safety of yourself and safety of others, they protest in that. They will deliberately, you know, disobey. You got people walk around without masks, and the government saying wear masks. In California right now, man, it's a $375 fine, dude. It, like, they stipulate it. And if you're, like, I think in L.A. County, if you're in public, you have to have a face covering. And really just becomes a matter of if they're going to, uh, you know, if they're going to uh, um, enforce it. Like, if, if a cop rolls up on you and you don't have a face covering on, $375 uh, um, civil fine. Yeah, but the thing is, um, stores do not have to serve you at this point. With the new guidelines, they don't have to serve you. Exactly, exactly. People can refuse service. You can get fined. So there, there's a stigmatization that's going to be happening now here with people who don't adhere to, like, social distancing and CDC guidelines with regards to face coverings and shit. Well, you, but you, you, guys, you guys are running, we're running too loose because um, I, I saw, you know, out in Arizona, one of my boys is out there, and, you know, he would, yeah. you know, I, I talked to him. He, he would have his stuff on. But you know he would go out to um, like Costco and stuff. And no, people yeah, people ain't wearing it. They're not wearing it. Yeah, they're not wearing it. It's yeah, and people out there, you know, you know, running real, real loose. And now mm -hmm. all of a sudden, their numbers are climbing like there's no tomorrow. When well, they're the going, let me, you know? they're going. It's a, it's a hundred. It was a hundred and six degrees today. Yeah, right? man. It's people, hot, people don't hardly they hardly don't want to. Yeah, they hardly don't want to wear shit anyway. I tell them to put a mask on too. It, it, it's it's hot in New York, man. But you know the name of the game is is uh. It was funny because uh, Tuesday I had to go to the polls. You know, uh, I'm a district leader, so I was out there, and I was out there for a short while. We had to set up my my, my ward table, and um, you know, they had a couple of ward workers there, and and oh my God, they went to this one school, and they had all the the the, the four schools that usually open in, in my area. They only had uh, it was like two that were open, and so the lines were long, and people were this. It was all fucked up, but people were still trying to distance themselves, and everybody had masks on, you know. I was out there with a mask. 
I got I had my goggles and my um <laughs> and my gloves. I looked like I was ready to uh you know I I was getting ready to, to you have to a hazmat it. suit on. <laughs> I had a hazmat man. I was I was I was like I was like all y'all's a restrained sucker out here. Forget about it. I'm not going out. I'm not going down like y'all. So I was kind of you know like kind of laughing, but still, everybody was natted up, and um, New York City still isn't really open. You know, New York City is not open. You know, so um, you know it's. We've taken it kind of seriously, but what I, I was a little bit surprised at looking at, you know, California and Arizona, you know, that people were just walking around like, all right, this is over. Really? Nah, it's, all, really? It's, all the, it's all the Western states. It's Utah, Arizona, California. Uh, I think Texas was in it. And it was a New Mexico, not New Mexico. I don't think New Mexico was. But yeah, Western states, man, I don't know. Over the last two weeks, shit got real. And, and and now I think it's you know it's gonna it's gonna hit pretty hard. So um, uh, you know I, I don't know people people just just please just wake up, man. This, this this shit is far from over, man. It's far from over. So yeah. nah, I was gonna, hey, what's up, everyone? Yeah, hey, what's going on, Renaissance man? Hey, nothing much. Hey, what's up, Nago? Yeah, no, I was going to say, people gotten crazy. Um, Texas was the main one, Texas and Florida. Uh, cases spiking like crazy because uh, my boss was saying his uh, his son lived down there in Austin, and he was saying they, they people weren't wearing masks. They went to Home Depot. You had employees. They had a mask on. People telling them, oh, you don't have to wear a mask. So, you know, it's uh, – it, they, they're too wide open with it. Like you said, I think I think Cuomo came out and said, hey, you know, you all chose politics over science, which is uh, quite true. Um, New York uh, and the Northeast seem to have gotten this right, and everyone else seems to have been a little lack of dex- lack- lackadaisical. Um, with regards to the actual uh, article you were talking about, Mike, one thing I found interesting today was I was listening to CNBC, and uh, they were talking about a lot of these Wall Street executives are starting to basically assume that Joe Biden's going to win the presidency. And they're starting to get concerned. And that's why you're starting to see some of the sell off in the market. So you, you, you're if that continues, you'll continue to see, you know, the economy hurting and you'll see the stock market go down a little bit, which has sort of been the, the bright light and the thing that Trump has tried to tout in all this. So you might see those be brought in the line. Well, I find that interesting because I don't think it matters if he wins or not, because whether who says who's in the White House, you're, you're going to have this issue, right? Well, they're talking about with regard to policies. They're worried Biden's going to raise the corporate tax rate from the executive side. So they're worried about profits. Right. So, so you've got this stock market that's overvalued, that's, that's overvalued right now, uh, as well as, um, you know, if, if it continues to go down, it could put you in a credit crunch uh, just because of, uh, you know, access to capital, stock prices being lower. Um, maybe some interest rates rising as well to companies not being able to have as much access to capital. So that could hurt as well. Well, oh, well you know, they can, they can it, always just pump more money into the economy. You know, there's all, there's a solution for that. Well, well, yeah, there, there is, but, but I was just saying also there's, you know, people look at the market going down 500 points and people are like, Oh my gosh, a lot of profit taking was taken. I mean, uh, that's, you, that's what you had to look at. I mean, I had gotten into Norwegian cruise lines. I had told, um, complex about it i'd gotten in um uh, let's say under nine dollars i'll say you know average uh price um uh, around seven and a half but i got some at nine and, and some at six and um that sucker ran to 26 dollars 26 bucks so got a, um got a few of those uh, boeing uh Oxygen, it, it, some companies it, like it, that it, yeah it, 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 it ran strictly on the um you, you know on the hype and you know they got their money and i knew it was a Kind of short term play. I put some money to the side and I put it, my, you know, the profits back in the, you know, back in my um, Microsoft stock that I, I I first bought at seventy and where it is right now. So it's uh that's that's retirement money. But as far as that's what's going on in the market, you got this kind of stuff going on where there's a lot of money being made and people are popping out. So there's a lot of profit taken right now and there are a lot of companies that are being hyped with i mean that may have been well run before covid but yet you know it's still being hyped and you know they you know the, you know the, the technicals and the fundamentals on them are really not really not strong but people are buying it because you know they 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 you know they they're stock plays there's a, there's a lot of that going on so there's a lot of, a lot of profit taking you know this this game's got to shake out a little bit um so i say if you really know what you're doing in this market play around if you really don't 
um, I would say be, be, be very conservative. But, you know, I'll take a high flyer every now and again because I kind of I see how this thing works a, a bit. I've been around it for a lot for many years. So I see what's going on right now. But Fed funds rate, you know, they're really trying to bring interest rates further down. That's not a good sign as I keep looking at that. The bank to bank lending rate, there's some key things that I'm looking at that I'm I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy about, of course, because we know that, you know, we, we are kind of in 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 somewhat of a, of a recession. So I would say. Uh, you know, the real super strong ones play long term, looking to really grab a lot of quick, fast profits is a very risky game unless you understand certain things. Norwegian was a very well run company. It had a very low P.E. and so forth. They were doing very well until this thing hit. So there's some belief that this is a strong company. I still believe in it again. I don't know if I'm going to get the kind of deal I had on it when, when I first jumped into it, uh, you know, you, you know, a little over a month, you know, about a month ago. But. But that's where we are, you know. I mean, six to twenty-six dollars in a month—that's that's highly butter laid. But yep. you're not, you know, you're not going to see a lot of moves like that. You know, you, 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 you know, being made like that, and not a lot of guys jumped on it, you know. But um, I told some people, but you know, hey, it's what it is. But um, but but that, but that's where we're at. I, I'm I, I'm just saying it's a, it's, a, it's a real kind of you know um, shaky market. So um, be 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 careful in, in how you're going to play in how you're going to play this. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I, I was going to quick. I was going to quickly ask you too, Mike, on with regards to like you were talking about the Xbox release. You don't see Microsoft going to like a direct, uh, sort of almost like sneakers does with Nike when they have a release of you know you put in a ticket and you can do it all from the app versus pushing back the release. No, no, no. I'm not saying that. Um, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying if job losses continues throughout the summer and throughout the, uh, you know, in, into Black Friday, people may be apprehensive about spending any more money. Stimulus check. <laughs> well, you, you know, they're, they're still talking about second, second and third rounds, right? Yep. Um, credit yep. card companies have dropped, you know, people's uh, uh, limits, spending limits. You know, you had a $500 spending limit before, you can rest assured it's, it's at $300 now. Um, yeah. And rich people not spending. And rich and the, the 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 super rich are not really spending right now. They're not buying a lot of stuff, but they are there, market and so forth, doing certain kind of things. But they're not out there buying a lot of uh, buying a lot of items. Waiting well, on then, the prices to fall. Yeah. Well, but then you also have this uh, evictions uh, scenario that's kind of lingering in the background, right? Um, where I think that that whole CARES Act. There's a provision in the CARES Act, which basically states that as long as the, you know, well, the CARES Act states that uh, that that basically there's an evictions exemption while the nation is under, uh, I guess, this 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 emergency or whatever, whatever they're calling it. Like when the, with the CARES Act being instituted, there is a provision with regards to evictions. However, it's up to the states to enforce it okay so i read today that in uh los angeles you had our landlord group who basically filed suit against the city yeah, to say hey look I was, huh? I, was to, I was gonna ready to mention that um that yeah because i, I yeah. see a, i see a i see a housing crisis coming there you go i was gonna say so yeah if you if we're per, if we're forecasting and projecting here i'm, I'm much i'm much like what uh with uh what perfect just said um I, I see skittish spending. I even said myself, I was like, well, you know, there were some things I wanted to buy. I kind of just put it off a little bit. I said, let me, let me have a little more cash reserves and then I'll make the purchase. I'll feel more comfortable about it. But if I feel that way, I would imagine there's a lot of other people who are basically feeling similar sentiments. So there's that, there's that lingering issue of of this toll evictions and housing issue that 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 is coming here so so do you think it's they're going to follow through once once they from once they open up the economy you know full time it's going to be a lot of folks getting put out well that's the problem you know and everything that we've been talking about here there's the assumption that we're going to do that but then all of a sudden you get a surge in numbers and then and then and then uh cities like houston they go back to a lockdown, which they just did, mm -hmm. right? So we can talk about like a win 
when the when the open up, when the open up. Okay, but what if you did open up and now you just shut back down? And like I, said, and I was gonna LA, say too. LA, uh, a suit from these uh, landlords. Well, so, okay. One minute that they're, they're not being watched closely by uh, you know in the real estate market. That's being well, I, I, uh, okay. I want to let Renaissance go, and then I'll address what you're saying because I, the the angle that was being taken, and I, uh, BGS actually did a video on this too. So he oh, covered yeah. it because we're we're both here in Southern California, right? So we both have heard this is a thing out here. This kind of made the news because, um, yeah, you had a landlord group that sued the city that said, "Hey, look, when this 90 day period from the time there was a there was a 90 day moratorium originally, okay." Past the 90 days, it becomes a CARES Act provision, but the, the, the municipalities and the states have to actually enforce it. So, so it's like once the 90 days up, it goes back to just de facto, unless the municipalities enforce the CARES Act provision. But the landlord group preemptively is suing the city ahead of time. This is what we got. Go ahead, Renaissance, I'm sorry. No, 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 you're fine. No, I just literally wanted to ask, like, in regards, like, how much can you push people, though? Because you, you already see, like, the protest is somewhat calmed down. But if you start, like, really pushing people out on the street and people don't have a job, we're talking about no recovery. Uh -huh. I mean, you're, uh -huh. I mean, dude, you're literally talking about just throwing fire on something yeah. that's kind of losing yep. some steam right now. Yep. That, that's yeah. why I said this COVID-19 thing has really exposed some weaknesses in this economy. Uh, because there are a lot more people who are living uh, paycheck to paycheck that have very little saved and everything like that. And now they're not working. And now, you know, when this whole thing is over or even getting close to being over, and they, a lot of people get ready, get ready to get put out. Well, they're let's look at work Because not everybody's going back to work when they do open it up. A lot of people are not going back to work. A lot of these companies have figured out, you know, we can do a lot of stuff, you know, you know, from you know with, with a lot less employees right you can work from home it's gonna be a well, lot of that let's look at the other side of this too uh because again i think it, it, bgs's video he he made he made a point to mention this too the other side of the equation is the investor class right so now on the investment side of things you know if let's say you're you own a building okay you still have tax commitments right you still have loan commitments you have those too. You see, so it's not it's not necessarily a greedy landlord type of situation. It's like, okay, well, the landlord's looking at it it's like, okay, well, fuck. Okay, now um, you know, I may have leveraged or hedged to do yeah, this real estate exactly. deal one way or another. Now I'm fucked. No, yeah, I totally I was gonna... understand that because the landlords, they it's it's basically like they've been told to uh, to stay open for business and not get paid. But they still they still have the tax commitments, right? So are they being told they that you're on liability? Oh, yeah, they're yeah. You, you liability, on, but they're open right. for business, but they are, but they buy by by order of the doggone uh, uh, state or the city or whoever you know or, or whatever. They've been told basically to uh, to service the people without being paid. Right, but and I was gonna say, but are they also being told that their tax payments can be put off? Uh, are they are they are they being told that if they put off or they, if they don't make the tax payments that they're going to withhold penalties? Are they being told that? I, I, I highly doubt that. They're not. Yeah, and that's no, why they're suing the goddamn city, because they're like, look, y'all you know, ain't about to throw us a bone. One way or another, you're going to pay them taxes. Them taxes <laughs> yeah. Right. <I'll> support you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're going to pay them goddamn taxes. Like, And landlords know this shit. That's why they're not playing. They're like, well, yo, y'all ain't, ain't about to give us some sort of stimulus. Yeah, and I was going to say, perfect, like you said, it's not just people who are poor who are living paycheck to pe paycheck. You had people with higher salaries who were living paycheck to paycheck. Damn and right. they I found themselves. Exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. They're heads, all, these, all these Airbnb people who got in that business and were banking on those to make money, they in trouble. Bro, yeah. all that glitters ain't gold, man. Like a lot of people think motherfuckers are just cashed up like that, and they're not. Oh, man. Um, the uh, I'm hearing rumblings about the uh, what do you call it the uh, the uh, RV market you know the trailer home market uh, is, is supposed to have um, considerable um, movement over the next uh, six months. Oh yeah, oh, no yeah. football, no uh, or racing is cut cut back. That's a big part of their market is people tailgating at college football. 
No, we're talking about people actually acquiring them because, you know, as a, as a living option, mobile living options. Because oh, okay. Okay. I thought you meant what's like. Happening. Yeah. Yeah, because people are being evicted out of their homes. They got to go somewhere. Right. They got to go somewhere. Shelters. Not enough shelters. All the motels, you know, um, you know, the extra stays and all, the, and all those uh, uh, motel chains, they're already tapped out. You know, women and children first. They already took on all those... Uh, uh, immigrants and everything else, so, and, and they've been sitting in those places for two, three, four years with bed bugs and you know uh, needles, and now COVID. What a, what a disaster that is! So, a lot of these people who can't afford to pay their mortgage and uh, who are going to be upside down, uh, are trying to get out while the getting is good, and they may consider you know moving into a tiny house. Yeah. Now I was going to say, but at some point, I figured the 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 government's going to have to negotiate with some of these landlords because if you're a landlord and you kick people out and there's no demand, you're still in a bad situation because if you can't fill it, you still got bills to pay. Well, this is why the landlords forced the issue. That Yeah. You, this, you is have why they, this is why they, yeah. Because look, uh, I have a, a one of my partners. Um, so the same building that he's in, in Venice, um, there's a, a motel like in that same that same commercial space, right? And so the guy who owns it, it's like 48 units. So you know what this dude did? He was smart. He went down to the city and was just like, hey, look, you know what? This whole shit is affecting my business, but here's what I'll, I'll do. If you want to stipend me, I'll go ahead and open up all, all, all of my units. And, you know, if you've got like, like, you know, they have like these homeless programs and relocation programs right like so say like women who have maybe been in a situation where they were being yeah. abused and then they put them in a temporary living situation okay this dude he basically made his building available for that those programs and man look the city's paying them to house people so that, he that's, took that's what you got to do yeah that's what i mean he was just like fuck it man he's like look dude like not it's not every day you're gonna be able to get beachfront uh property in venice so in these type of situations, you do what you got to do to hold on to what you have. So if I got to turn it into a, you know, a, a, a public living facility for some time and let the and, and let the, and let uh, the city of LA stipend me for it, fuck it. Yeah, but that's at least a win-win versus if they just go to okay, we're going to evict people. You kind of right. lose on both ends. But look, I, I mean, as it is right now, like I said, man, you know, you you. The city's not going to really do it. You got to force the city's hand, right? So the landlords are like, look, you know, if we turn around here at the end of this 90 days and we, ask, we start asking for rent, we're going to be made to look like, look like the bad guys. Okay? But fuck, we have commitments. We've gone 90 days without getting shit. And, and who do you think our lenders are? Who do you think they're calling? My, the, 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 the fucking renters? No, they're calling me. Okay? So unless you've got something in plan, that I can then go back to them and say, hey, look, well, the city or the state or whoever is working with me. And so when they're gonna be working with me, I can work with you. If we're gonna be doing something like that, then great. But in the meantime, right about now, it's just one of these things where I guess after 90 days, I'm just gonna have to start asking for rent. What am I in good faith, just supposed to go on the whole CARES Act provision and just continue to not ask for rent and then tell my lenders, hey, well, you know, COVID. Yeah. They can't eat COVID. If they could, what would it taste like? Chicken? I don't know, but the investors, they, 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 the investors are not, they can't eat COVID. And the landlords can't eat on COVID. The, the, the only really thing that you can bank on kind of saving some of this is if you get a vaccine. That's really your only hope right now. I don't even think it's that, man, because it even look, even with vaccine, even with all these things, we're not going to see our return to the uh, work in the, the, the work environment that we had once before, man. It's it's remote work is the thing now. No, no, I, I no, no, definitely. I just think as far as actually being able to open the economy and keep it open now that you're right on the work front. But right oh, now, but you're talking like, about like like public, just yeah, just being able to not okay, be under shelter okay. in place like that. Right, right. It's looking like what we're having to go back to, right. at least in like some of these states that are surging. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, let me read this real uh this article real quick and we can uh, open it up. Okay. Uh, this is from Engadget.com. Microsoft will double its black senior leadership by 2025. The company is also also plans to work with more black owned businesses. Following the likes of Google and some of its other peers in the space, Microsoft unveiled a racial equality initiative on Tuesday. In a letter signed by CEO Satya Nadella, the company said it's committed to addressing racial injustice and inequity. To that end, Microsoft detailed several changes it's making to support Black individuals both inside and outside of the company. Most notably, the company plans to double the number of Black and African American managers senior individual contributors and senior leaders. It employs in the U.S. by 2025. Uh, Additionally, the company will spend an additional $150 million on its diversity and inclusion efforts. The company also wants to help make its non-Black employees better allies. Starting in the company's fiscal 2021 year, Microsoft will mandate mandatory training on allyship and privilege for all employees. Part of the course material will touch on understanding the experience of Black communities. Outside of its own walls, the company plans to double the number of Black-owned businesses it works with over the next three years. It will spend $500 million with both existing and uh, new suppliers. The company says it spent more than $2.9 billion in its 2019 fiscal year working with women-owned suppliers along with businesses run by people identifying as minorities, disabled veterans, and other. Some of the uh, some of the other investments Nadella announced today include a $50 million fund dedicated to supporting Black-owned small businesses and the creation of a $100 million program that will assist minority-owned depository institutions. Interesting. The company will also make a five-year, $50 million investment in its existing justice reform initiative. Microsoft's efforts could go uh, a long way toward making it more inclusive to the Black community. However, the, like most tech giants, the company still has a long way to go. And it, in its 2019 diversity and inclusion report, Microsoft said 4.5% of all of its employees and 2.7% of its executives are Black. In the same report, the company said white individuals make up 53.2% of its workforce, more than half. The overwhelming majority of the of Microsoft employees, 72.3%, are also men. But all, but at least for now, Microsoft appears committed to changing things. This is not a one-time event, wrote Nadella. It will require real work and focus. We will listen and learn. We will take feedback and we will adjust. But it starts with each of us making a commitment to do the work uh, to help drive change and to act with intention. I thought this was pretty good. I thought what Google did last week was actually a strong move, but I think what um, Nadella is doing is actually pretty a strong move, just as much as uh, Google's. Um, now, what did Google do, just for reference? They pledged $175 million to um, uh, it's uh, initiative for black uh, black businesses and um, um, in innovation. Okay. Basically, helping black um, people get into tech um, and, and and funding a lot of it. Um, it, it, it. Really strong move that they did. But this is just as strong too. Um, Another thing that would be nice to see in all this would be if you have this COVID situation, which is disproportionately affecting black people and putting them out of work, putting some sort of retraining in the place that says, hey, we're going to go and hire these people who have been laid off because of COVID and retrain them and bring them in. Mm -hmm. That that would be something cool as well, too. Well, one of the things that um, one of the things that um, I think it's overlooked is the, because he said, he mentioned allyship, and I think that's an actual um, interesting point to make. Um, a $50 million fund dedicated to supporting black owned small businesses and the creation of a $100 million program that will assist minority owned depository institutions. Minority owned depository institutions. That's really true. <laughs> I think, uh, I think perfect black had a um, interesting take on that, that statement right there. Yeah. But it, it, I want to be, uh, you know, uh, more. Optimistic. No, 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 no. That's what I know. That's what I mean. But yeah. when you, when you question what, 
they mean by that, right? It it does kind of you you do kind of scratch your chin a little bit, right? Minority owned, That's, right? Uh, Especially when they're talking about the you know people, you know the board and all of that. You know those are gonna be women. They're, they're, they're gonna they're, they're gonna be women. They're gonna be black women. They ain't gonna be. Women. Well, we didn't yeah. want to do yeah. that, but <laughs> yeah, I, I want to be more optimistic about this. But I think one of the things that they can do is support black startups, right? And actually partner with them and actually give them access to Azure and all of the uh, cloud computing space and things of that nature. I think that's a, a, that would be an even stronger uh, initiative to take. Now, hey, Mike, you know what? Let me let me say this in contrast to that. Um, and I, I want to say I actually sent you. Well, it was a, it was some time ago, man. It's maybe back in like either late December, or January, after I got the Mara phone. But um, and I want to say we actually I actually even uh, covered the details of it on a live stream. But now Mara phone as a company, like okay, so they have a little brochure that comes in their phone, right? So if you are a developer, Mara basically will set you up with. AWS vouchers, right? To to basically begin to develop to to use AWS to develop applications and stuff like that, and you know perhaps say for employment with uh, deployment on on a Mara device. So they put this in the phone, like they have a brochure that's in there. There's a little QR code. You scan it, and then you can redeem your AWS voucher. And I think it's like a total like twenty five hundred bucks in uh, AWS, uh, uh, in access to AWS trainings and development tools and stuff. Yeah, but keep in mind, that's an African phone, right? So it's, it's really geared toward, you know, the people on the continent, not so much as- Oh, no, uh, no, no, I, that's what I was saying. It was, to, I, I mentioned this to contrast what you were saying. Oh, yeah, yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. I understand what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because outside of that, it, it, had you had not ordered the phone, well, a lot of people would never have known it. They would have never even known it, yeah. Right, right. but the, the thing here is that, um, at least for what I'm saying is that because Black Business, because we read that article about a week or so ago um, on Black Tech Talk that talked about Black-owned businesses being least funded in contrast to other um other groups of business, uh, other groups who have startups, right? More importantly, white males make up 70% of the um, funding. They can come up with the shittiest fucking business model and get millions of dollars for it, dude. It's amazing. Yeah. And so what I'm saying is these are areas that they can actually assist in. Things that the government should have done a long time ago. These are areas that I would like to see uh, uh, done, right? I, I would like to see these companies like Microsoft, Oracle, uh, Facebook and whatnot, partner with black startups, fund those black startups as an initiative, right? If, if that's gonna be the case, right? I don't want you just throwing money at you know the term minority and black too. Uh, if it's gonna be for black, let it be for black. I think right. rather than to just go down to HBCUs and hire more people from uh, HBCUs, I think you should go in underserved communities. That well, makes sense. I think, I, I think, yeah, I think it has to be the incubator model we keep talking about. Right, right. And, and so when they, I don't have any it gripes with the HBCUs or anything like that, but what happens with HBCUs is that they're so concentrated in certain areas that the areas that need the most help, which would be the opportunity zones, get the least amount of investment. <laughs> they get the least amount of support. And so you have this repetitive cycle of brain drain, whether somebody goes to an HBCU or a PWI, or they get hired and have to relocate from, you know, Baltimore to say, you know, to San Jose or something like that. I think that's, mm -hmm. I think that's a poor, poor way of approaching it. Well, and that's what we were trying to explain to these brothers last night on um, Mr. Fantastic's panel. Oh, 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 uh, um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just see when, when I hear language like that, uh, that you read, uh, Mike, I'm just not too confident because when I hear this, uh, minority people of color and LGBT, when, when, when I hear that, I, I just don't see them coming to, uh, you know, uh, black areas, uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to, to, you know, to as their pool of, of, uh, uh, minorities. I, I just don't.
Well, well this is this is why we're talking about the incubator model, right? This, this is this is this is why what we're looking at here is to is to actually capitalize and leverage this. It it has to be an incubator model. That's how it has to work. This is the same thing Mike and I were trying to explain to you. Well, I, I heard the conversation. I had to come on, you know, because they they weren't they weren't really getting where Mike was coming from with it. But um, no, but I no, heard that. that. I, I I actually heard that, and I, I just oh, okay. Couldn't, yeah. I, could, I couldn't hear it anymore. I had to I had to, yeah. I had to turn off the. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I did. I had to turn it off, and I was telling my wife, "I said this is not a this is not a an, uh, an honest thing." Right. So I had to stop it, but I heard it. But this no, is this is kind of this speaks to you know that that whole exchange from last night. It's like, you know, um, you got to look at how 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 the inf uh, how the institutional biases have occurred and why it is you have such a disparity between funding in certain areas when it comes to education versus a seeming abundance of of, of money in other areas. You know what I mean? And and, I, I and like Mike said, just like they, going I, just, huh? No, I, I, just, I just don't see them, uh, uh, you know, you know, in, in, you know, installing any type of, um, and I'm, what I mean by that, I mean, in this instance here, uh, in this example here uh, with Microsoft, I just don't see them doing anything like that unless they're actually forced to do it. No, that's what, that's why it has, that's, see, what we always do is we... We, we have expectations for what the quote unquote right thing is, right? And then we expect them to adhere to those expectations. Mm -hmm. And companies do what is just essentially acquire, required to just deal with an issue and move on. Because guess what? That's not their fucking priority, man. Their priority is their shareholder obligations, mm -hmm. okay? See, so what yeah. we do is we go to them and say, okay, look, here's what's acceptable. You see this incubator we have here? Yeah, dump the money there and we're good. Problem solved. Yeah. No, I agree Another. with that. I, no, I, I do agree with that. You're absolutely right on that. No, I was gonna, go, go right ahead, Renaissance, please. No, I was just going to quickly add another way. I heard Roland Martin talking about changing, uh, sort of you talking about startup and funding, Mike, the VC world. He was saying, which I didn't think about until he, he laid it out, that you're going to have to get a lot of these pension funds who a lot of Black people work in the public sectors, your teachers, uh, you know, post office, government employees that have pension funds, you know, those are some of the major investors for some of these uh, Wall Street funds to go then invest. And he was saying they're going to have to sort of stand up and say, hey, you know, are we working with black firms or all these peep firms employing, you know, what, are, what do they look like? And thus, when you make that demand, that in turn ter uh, changes the makeup of these companies and the VC world. Mm -hmm. So but I, these, I, that was these a perspective pension, I didn't think about. These pension funds, even though they might be, um, when I when I was, I don't know about how it is now, but when I was um, used to live in Dade County, in, in Florida, there was a, a pension fund down there that most of the people in there were black people. Because at the time, a lot of a lot of guys were prison guards and so forth. And they had at the head, at the, the, the guys who were in charge of this thing were all Caucasian. So guess what they're going to invest in? You know what I'm saying? They're not yeah. going to throw their money at some, you know, black guy. He might be amazing, but he's not going to get their money. Yeah, so that's, that's where you have to have the pension holders be, be more cognizant of, hey, who who is managing the funds and what do they look like and are they if they're like you said a bunch of uh white dudes running this fund of course there's probably going to be some bias towards who they then turn around and invest in mm -hmm. uh -huh. so it, it, it's kind of a conscientiousness on behalf of the people at that level they're not interested in in, in stuff like that the only thing they're interested in is doing their 30 years or 20 years whatever the case might be and getting their pension. They're not yeah. interested in, in, in what the company is invested on or whatever the case might be. Yeah, I remember no, I... the cleaners at United Airlines, they were like 90% of the cleaners of United were what they call minority. That's how United get around hiring um, black pilots 
or you know that's how United got around hiring black players. They would say, you know what, we have we have a, our quota of minorities already. So their union invested the money in what? You know, they made the union. I mean, you have people <laughs> that were making twelve dollars an hour. And the people in charge of the union who were supposed to be watching their money making hundred thousand dollars a year. They don't care about the union people. Yeah, no, that that's where that's where it kind of has to has to change in the sense of people people being more conscientious of of these and and how it flows through. You know, that's kind of how Atlanta changed with uh, like Manuel Jackson coming to power and and really saying, okay, like, hey we make up X amount of the city and we're only getting like, you know, nine or 10% of the contracts. And he literally threatened the banks who didn't have any black representation and their companies on their board. He literally threatened to take the city's money out of the Atlanta city banks and move it to like California and things like that. And that's what really opened up the city and gave uh, uh, people who were black, uh, you know, a real jump start on, you know, really having some investment and, and some businesses in the city. So it's just, people have to be aware of that stuff. Yeah. yeah, and I, and I remember Maynard. He he was um, he also you know was one of the first ones to to really push even with the airports, the airline concessions, and um, you know making sure that black business people had you know um a percentage of that at least. Oh yeah, 12%. building the whole building the whole airport, making sure that they were you know airport and made sure that you know those those concessions were there for black businesses as well. So um, you know, we have to use our political. Um, as well as, um, you know, our economic power together, you know, to kind of um, gain, gain where we will, you know, where we will have um, a better result. You're not going to gain a great result around a bunch of white folks and you're a very small minority level there. Not going to happen. But where you have greater numbers, where you can exert greater, um, greater influence and and have greater power, that's where we should be, um, um, doing well um doing a lot better economically you know that's you know and and politically as well they 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 go hand in hand so um that's what we um actually should be doing so the areas where we tend to have larger populations we should be doing better there by um by exerting such by exerting such powers and um making those companies whoever who are coming into those areas you know um definitely more amenable for, for us and um and and and, f- and helping to start and finance and uh, well not start but I mean I'm gonna helping to finance and and kick into our uh to our startups for for sure because you know some will fail but but some will do exceedingly well so so the payoffs will will, will be good well but, um, you know but Nagone that's why the incubator idea man yeah, um, yeah. and Mike can attest to this because yeah. when you when you have an incubator you're so it's like you, you're 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 kind of incubating multiple businesses. So yeah, now we're, I, we're, we're sharing. We're, yeah, we're yeah, sharing well, skill sets and reset and resources across the board. And so what we can do is in an incubator environment, we can largely minimize those those uh, those business losses. You know, the attrition from business. If if it's cultivated in an incubator environment, man, studies have been done on this. This is why all of all of like your 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 new tech companies they always spurn out of some sort of incubator of some kind or some sort of subset of a company. So if it wasn't an incubator, it was a company that was spawned by, by uh, engineers uh, of, a, of, of, of a parent company or, or, or what would become the parent company, right? Yeah, well, it's funny. One of, the, one of the companies that are a fairly sizable client of mine right now, Global Spec, they uh-huh. were being incubated by... Um, by by another you know you know very large you know engineer. there's a larger entity that was uh, above a, okay. a larger I don't say yeah. a larger engineering um a, a media type of company but mm-hmm. these guys took a more niche aspect to it and they were incubated inside and then they had some strong money behind them War, warbrook pincus and some other players came into the game and um uh you know also helped to you know you know you know add a great degree of financing and um their business started to turn a profit after a certain period and boom, you know, they, they took off to their own. Now they're um, global spec 360 and all that. So they got a whole lot of new stuff going on, going on with them. Um, mm-hmm. You know, fairly valuable, valuable client of mine, but, but that's what, uh, you know, that, that I've seen a, a lot of that going on and that's with white companies and, and, and they do, 
you know, they 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 incubate, you know, like crazy. Should we have that? And 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 it's, well, it's just part of our business model. You're damn right it is. So yep. so we it should be heavily yep. heavily involved in that. Heavily heavily. Yeah. Right. Heavily. I mean, because look, I'll tell you right now, man. Um, so um, my EV project basically is the result of a company that received incubator funding, right? So we're looking at how uh, a company that leverages uh, an incubator for, for funding and, and, uh, and development purposes can then more expediently reach the end user, which is somebody like myself, right? So Y Combinator came in, uh, scooped up OS, uh, OS vehicle, right? Um, then other companies then started to get involved because Y Combinator got involved, right? Then what happened was, is that um, I want to say Y Combinator took like, I think how it worked was that there was a, basically a, another interest came in and then essentially a new company was formed out of that company, which Y Combinator still maintains like a, a minority shareholder of which I'm, I'm, all, I'm saying all this to illustrate a benefit of maybe even being a part of an incubator, right? Because now what you do is when those companies get sold off, that incubator maintains like maybe a minority stake in this company. So now the incubator has more capital to play with to incubate more companies. So the, the incubator in and of itself is, is a business, but we're also just looking at from a startup standpoint, how one, Startups can, can benefit from being in an incubator environment. And then two, how we can better leverage the capital from uh, contributions like companies like Google, the tune 175 million. That's why I was like, man, that shit could be put to way better use if that money's dumped into an incubator, not just a company that's led by a quote unquote minority because that's perfect black stated. That could be anything. Well, yeah, and, and the fiduciary management aspect of it should go into something like an a uh, um an aab right and uh aadb an african uh, african american development bank that allows you to pull re, uh the, the the resources necessary to fund those startups so that they get the necessary funding right and the you, say, you gotta have the incubators are gonna have to have a banking partner yeah yeah and and, and, and you know um that's where your black banks come up um you know, come up short, but that's where they can actually be leveraged. And that's where you start forcing people to say, hey, if you want to see more of this, you got to start, you got to start investing uh, or putting your money into black. Uh, you got to put it into the black bank, right? Yeah, yeah. That's a good move. That's a good, that's a good point, Mark. That's a good point. Yeah. So th this, this is part of the issue. And to, to engineering cannabis's point um, in the chat, he said startups are a trial and error in judging market need, all startups should always start with a problem. Why a combinator is a perfect incubator. Yeah, but the yep. thing is, when we talk, when I talk about the startup sector for black uh, for black startups, I always I always been you know hard on the idea of a social enterprise aspect, meaning that the issues that plague the black community the most that can be leveraged from a technology standpoint should be resolved by those people in that in that neighborhood and should be funded by the people in, in, in uh, um, uh, funded to those people in, in that neighborhood. So in other words, I've told this story many times before, if there was a need, uh, you know, you had trash on the ground in the neighborhood because there were no trash cans. City put out some dumb trash cans and they only picked up the trash once a week. The trash kept overflowing, the squirrels and the, and the, and the animals were eaten out of it. And so it, it was just as messy as it was before. Someone came up with the great idea to put, uh, uh, to create this uh, smart trash can that had a scale on the bottom of it connected to a Wi Fi uh, um, uh, controller that sent out a text message to uh, sanitation workers to come pick me up when I'm full. Okay, problem solved. And it had a solar panel on top of it. Um, so that it, it did not need to be connected to the grid. That's the sort of social impact that um, innovative ideas can have. So those sort of those sort of uh, uh, ideas and innovation should be funded in those neighborhoods, but they don't get access to those funding to those, to that sort of uh, resources because it's not available to them. 
you got a hundred million dollars, I think that that's a good way to spend it. Mm-hmm. It's a good way to invest it. Let them fix their own problems. That's the way how it should be. Not not somebody come in and say, well, you know, hit his twenty thousand dollars, do something with that. No, that's bullshit. That's bullshit. Give them the same equitable uh, 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 um, fundraisings that that you know their white counterparts get. I bet you you'll see a whole lot of innovation come out of here then. I'm telling you, man. And and if it if it's in an incubator environment, I mean, when we just look at how many tech companies that we look at today, you know, or or let's say in the past, right, that were of prominence, and then let's just say maybe they've been acquired or bought out or something like that. Mm-hmm. So many of these goddamn companies, man, were formed. They started out in incubators, man. They don't need to necessarily be bought out because it's a one-time deal, right? You're trying to solve the many myriad or the myriad of issues that people say is this in the black community. Trash was one thing. How about how do you uh, uh, test for air quality, right? And connect that to the grid and, and, and bring out all the metrics, cloud computing, IoT, micro transportation. Micro, I was gonna say, I mean, look, I'm like this, dude. Like for me, micro transport is probably the most turnkey solution you can get into right now, mm-hmm. right? Because it really just requires more like business licensing and permitting. Mm-hmm. Okay, the tech is turnkey, bro. Yep. It's turnkey. I could let's say somebody hit me up and was like, "Yo, um, I want to deploy a fleet of twenty scooters." in the city of Atlanta. Can we do that? I'll be like, yeah, do you have like, like, I mean, it, I, I'm not required to have them have all of their business licensing and permitting together in order to like get them a fleet and set up a, a software suite for them. I don't have to do that, but I would be like, yo, you got your shit together? Like, yeah, I already got my shit together. Dude, I'll have them, I'll have a container with brand new scooters and a laptop with the software suite in a week and then i'll say call me up and then we'll we'll go and we'll do the setup yeah that, that's you know it's, it's, i mean but that i'm saying that's that that's turnkey that's yeah. simple that's something that can literally happen like literally within a week this is how quickly we can do these types of things i, I think sometimes man people get caught up in 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 maybe um interpreting our discussions as like this this mountainous task that we have to undertake right yeah and 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 oftentimes i'm kind of like well no actually dude like in a lot of ways we i mean and and what it really kind of irks me is that dude we've actually demonstrated it we've held demonstrations like we actually showed like we possess the shit we we're we're boots on the ground oh we're here here's the conference boom like it's happening you get what i'm saying yeah, and, and that's the thing, you know, so many people want, you know, go oh, black boys should just go learn on their own, go read a book. But well, wait a second here. I mean, Come on. Public institutions if, the, if they can't be leveraged by the public. What the hell do you have uh, 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 politicians for if they don't represent the, the, the constituents? What, what's the point in having all this, all of this, even a functioning society? How do you have a functioning society that can't be leveraged? What planet are you niggas from, man? That's what I'm saying. It's just a matter of you have to do both. Yeah, that, that's what it is. You have to. You, you can't on one side rely on just your institutions. You have to have the initiative, but then on the other side, you you shouldn't just have all the initiative and say, "Oh, I don't need the institution because that that's your tax money." That's. But going wait a minute. It. As soon as as soon as as soon as Mike dared meant say that that we we need that part too. Because like I said, the, the, now, the demonstration side, oh, the brain trust got that shit on lock. Trust and believe. But we also address systemic issues, okay? We, we address it from, an equ- from, from, a, from a social equity standpoint. We, we, appro- we address it from a social justice standpoint. So let's not like, get shit twisted for anyone who out here is listening. Like, look, we're on our shit in terms of our technical aptitude, comp- competency, and what we do in the real world. But, you know, we do have to talk about the fact, though, that, um, again, in these sorts of environments here, when somebody, when a, you know, when somebody who's not, not a black male, let's just say that, um, can come up with the, with the dumbest ideas, okay, 
and get millions of dollars for it. And if the shit flames up, it flames up. Right. But, but see, I'm saying we can't get crucial money for like crucial needs. It, it, the thing is what they are normally going back to what we referred to last night. The ideas that these people have is that you shouldn't depend on anything. You should just do it yourself. If the Chinese government does not look at it that way, that's why they're accelerating at the way that they're doing. It's top down run. It's top down run. That's how you're supposed to run your society. But these, what these people are talking about is being more American, and to be more American means to be more, <laughs> be more. Critical. But then when you start saying, you know, be more privileged, how, how can they be more privileged if the very uh, uh, approach that you're you're you're, uh, uh, you're you're engaging them from it is from a, uh, a position of unprivileged. Nah, it's a it's a stigma. Um, I think uh, Amiri Brown says it best when he says, you know, um, the only people who are chastised for saying that the government should actually do what it's supposed to do are black people. Um, and, and that's where this really boils down to on that side. Like I said, you, you got to do both. But you have a certain segment that thinks you should just do uh, the, the by yourself part and you you shouldn't really uh, leverage what's rightfully yours. Well, if you do the by yourself part, right? Like you, you'll, 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 you know, you're gonna just do what you do, right? I got my, I have my, my little micro transport fleet. I have a shop, um, you know, COVID kind of <laughs> put the kibosh on a lot of shit. So everything's just been sitting, but um, I have it. Now, am I, a, am I a bird scooters? No. Am I a lime? No. You know, that's the main difference. The difference between me and them is capital. I got the same, I got the same tech. I have the same hardware. I got the same software. It utilizes the same smart devices. There's nothing that I do is that's different than what birds or Lime or anyone else does. The difference between me and them is capital, pure and simple. Yeah, and the thing is, um, you look at most of your successful uh, uh, country, China, uh, Germany, um, Singapore. These are technocratic societies. It's a technocratic society. What, what fucking world are these people coming from? Where can you can you speak on this, Mike? Please, bro. It, it's mind boggling to hear people talk like this, man. It's mind boggling. What 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 kind of society are you trying to run? Where every, <laughs> telling black people to uh, uh, not not only pull themselves up by their bootstraps but design their own boots? What? Where's the logic to this, man? You see, Mike, and, 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 and those kind of societies, you, you, you have people who are willing to, even people who have independent businesses. Say you have a business, I have a business, Complex got a business, you know, Nagon got a business. In those societies, we sit down and say, look, let's work out a deal here. We're going to go into this. We're going to put so much money in it, so much time in it. We're going to hire these people, hire this person this person, this person, person. Black people don't do that. Not even in, in countries that are run by black people, they don't do that. Well, well to, to, to an extent, I don't want to hold black countries in the same capacity because they, they are not of the same, uh, uh, um, you know, economic uh, 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 balance, right? They're not in the same, same ballpark. But when you think about the most innovative society, uh, uh, country, the ones that are pushing the most innovation, that's the way how they think. That's the way how they operate. And I'm saying, in America, you would think that a superpower that spent $14 billion on an aircraft carrier that doesn't even work, you know, these guys would actually hold their government accountable, but they protect their government. They protect them. Go out and do it yourself. Pull yourself up by your bootstrap. This is the same argument that they have against boomers. The boomers, you know, they did this and they took advantage of this and this, 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 and they didn't do anything for us. Pretty soon the, 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 the Zinnios are gonna be looking at the Gen Xs and saying, you greedy sons of bitches did the same thing, sitting behind, sitting on YouTube behind a keyboard and a microphone, man. Man, uh, guess what, that. guess what? Uh, man, I'm gonna tell you right now, man, these Every Gen Xs right here didn't do that. That's for goddamn sure. But everything that they have were bought for them by, well, except for this generation, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, the boomers gave their children everything that they wanted, more than they should have had. 
Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Where did the you know what you graduate high school? Here's a car. You want to go to college? I'll help you with that. You know, you go to college and get your then then you know you know what? Oh, mm-hmm. you didn't leave me anything, huh? Who paid the college? You know what I'm saying? Who bought your car? Who bought your food, your clothes, your shelter? You know, you you wearing two hundred dollar uh, Nikes. Who bought that for you? Right. You know, so, smartphone. <laughs> That's the thing. And, and, but you know what? Everybody's got their challenges. You know, every generation has its challenges. Some people don't want to face that challenge. They want somebody else to do it for them. now, today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know. Like I said before, um, if we're not going to allow racism to be used as, as a um, justification for equity, um, then you're not trying. To, you're not trying to fix your society immediately for where it is right now. We just read an article about Adidas. We read many of them over the last few weeks from many tech companies. People work from Facebook and Google and Microsoft and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And these same people will deny that this is even happening. What planet are you from, man? What world are you living in? Hey, Mike, you said an aircraft carrier that doesn't work. What was that? Oh, I, I, um, I there's about three I'm or four of them up there. Yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the jail Ford is one. I mean, the newest one they got, the, the catapult don't work. <laughs> the catapult <laughs> and, the, and the lifter, the one that brings the aircraft oh, wow. out of the out of the base. Yeah. <laughs> Millions of dollars. Oh, yeah. Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work. You have older equipment whose fucking catapults and lifters do work. Right? But we just spent a whole bunch of money on a new version of something that doesn't work. We have old versions that do. Make it make sense. And these same people will sit on a panel and defend the fucking government, man. <laughs> <laughs> Defend the, defend, defend the government and the racism that, that plagues black people and, and, and then tell everybody else, you, you know, stop complaining. You know, you, you guys taking down these statues and these monuments, that, that's not doing anything for you. Go read a book or something. I mean, there's sort of... Uh, Condescending. Yeah, it's, it's not... It's, even well, it's, not li- it's nihilistic, bro. It's nihilistic. Yeah, so you can't have a, a real honest conversation with these people, man. Um, I don't know where these guys came from. Like I said, it is not that much different between BLM and their rainbow colors and some of these guys in their, you know, their, their blue wrenches and their, and their blue Yeti microphone. <laughs> they're, all, they're all the same to me, in my opinion, man. Um, you know, they do they twerk in the chat, you know, BLM twerks in the protest. I don't, I don't see the difference. What's the difference? Yeah, you're, you're all twerking anyways. You all, you all got your colors that you like to raise, man. Cobalt blue and all types of blue that you put up there. So, I mean, you all, you all the same, man. <laughs> oh, fuck. I don't know. I, I thought that was um, pretty interesting, Mike, last night. Mm-hmm. It was a whole lot of, a whole lot of, it was a whole lot of babble. And then what I noticed was the conversation got very succinct, and then the conversation fucking the topic switched. <laughs> so and then it was like, "Where our work is done here." <laughs> some of, some of these guys came from Fortune. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna put that out there. Some of those guys came from Fortune, the cancel culture. Uh, uh, you know, back in 2017. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, with the uh, frogs and stuff like that, that they were running in the manosphere, uh, not the manosphere, on uh, black and uh, YouTube when they went after Tariq Nasheed. So I'm starting to see a lot of the same behavioral patterns, this sort of uh, smug behavior, shrug your shoulders. Oh, well, you didn't get a job. That's too bad for you. You know, oh, well. it sucks to be you. You know, that, that's sort of perspective, man. It, it's like, you know, wh- 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 who are these guys, man? And, and where did they come from? Why are they, why are they in the manosphere? In the manosphere, you know, for all intents and purposes, man, it's supposed to be about male solidarity. How, how, how can you be here and say these type of things and, and no one questions you? Well, I mean, I was going to say, I, I expect people to say things, right? But, you know, just, you know, but like you said, no one questions you, right? But 
I'm going to question that shit because sometimes, man, a lot of the things that I hear, I'm like, dude, like, I think you're the, the approach, the way you're thinking about it is like completely juxtaposed to where you, perhaps you should be thinking about it. I don't know. It's just not sounding right. Something's not adding up. So you got you got men that taking women's issues classes in college. You know what I'm saying? They're compromised, bro. Very much so. I agree with that one, D. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> go ahead, Mike. Go ahead, dude. Say it. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? Say it, dude. <laughs> this is uh, economics. I don't, I don't want to spend too much time. No. <laughs> But it has to do with economics. If, yeah. if you're thinking, your way of thinking is not as a man. You know what? I have to do this because so and so and so and so. And I have to make this plan. Whereas other people don't plan like that. Yeah. It's an economic issue. All planning. Men are, 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 are supposed to be logical. I just say it's supposed to be now, but you know, you're supposed to sit down, listen to another man talk, listen to that other man's logic, and say, look, well, here's here is where your logic is is flawed. But men don't men don't they start screaming. Right. I was gonna say D or or accept <laughs> or or accept when when someone proposes a superior position to yours and says your your position's flawed. Exactly. Right. right. You should, as a man, you're supposed to be able to do that without right. getting. Right. You you might raise your voice a little bit because you got to defend your position. Yeah. But after yeah. you see, man, my position is can't. It's not attainable. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's, uh, geez, man, I'm a, I'm I'm a default. You know what I'm saying? So okay, let's hear more nah, what you got to say. That leads to doxing and uh, YouTube beasts in the manosphere. Someone and that's and that's, your point. Highly, <laughs> that, that's so highly immature, Renaissance man. Because see. Um, and I've, I've mentioned this in prior live streams and we're on the open chat. So I guess this it's apropos, you know, like if you have, uh, you know, if you've ever had like discussions or been like, say like in a Masonic hall or something like that. Right. Um, this is kind of how discussions happen, you know, yeah. um, so, at a business meeting, the same thing. Exactly. Exactly. D exactly. Exactly. So, so for me, when things get, when they get heated, if they get lively, if the discussion is in the context, right? So if we get loud, but, but the loudness is about the point, about the topic, right? About the, the data, about the article, about a point in it or something like that, it's apropos, okay? Feelings though, right? You know, you know like getting emotional and then which, really, which results in the doxing shit or just very immature shit. Okay, that's the problem. That right there is the problem. Um, being being uh, being being very uh, 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 being being passionate about a position with regards to a, a, a geopolitical angle or something like that. No, that's that's of the highest and most importance. That is something you're supposed to be passionate about. You know, people in government are, are, are passionate about uh, enforcing. You know, not only the rule of law, but 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 also shit, whatever ho global hegemony agenda that they have. It's just it's it's it's, it's, it's apropos for the for for the environment uh, for for the for the venue. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, if you see the uh, if you ever watched the British Parliament, like when they're debating issues. Holy uh, shit! Yeah, you're you like wow. That? Yeah, they they get uh, people cheering. You almost think you're at a soccer game or something. Yeah, you ever seen like African Parliament? They fight. And they physically fight. They physically, they physically in fight. Russia, in Russia, they do the same exact thing. They too. do the same thing. Yeah, they don't, don't get down, man. Um, I remember the last one last year between the EFF and the ANC, they were throwing chairs. Mm -hmm. So, what, what Mike, saying, I remember that one. I remember that one. That motherfucker got live. Yeah, yeah was they were throwing chairs, real shit. They were throwing chairs, yo. Yeah, that was Ju Ju Julius Malema. But um, the point that I'm making here, man, is that. Um, in, in regards to like the sore loser syndrome, man, it's no different than when Tyson bit off Holyfield's ear, man. And um, that, that's exactly what they're doing in the ministry, yeah. man. <laughs> yep. That's exactly what they're doing in the ministry, biting off guys' ears and stuff like that, man. Running around with blue wrenches and blue yetis and shit like that. Um, rainbow colors, though. That's their rainbow colors. So. Hey, the Mike. Rainbow Coalition. 
My, it's a business, bro. It's, this is this is this is a business, man. <laughs> We're yeah, but, but what kind of business is it? I mean, <laughs> I, <laughs> hey, you, you need Wait, to ask the manager for that. that. Ask the ask the manager for that. Ask two point oh that question. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Serious. It's, it's it's like that. If you had this kind of business, here is the only, in the Negro manosphere is the only place that that kind of business is survive. I mean, I no. Just... It's it's like it's like every. It's like look. You know what? Uh, you guys allow me to embellish for just a moment, okay? One of your favorite commenters is in, is in the chat complex. Uh, <laughs> I have Zoom up. I can't. I can't read it. Zooms up. Um. <laughs> But yeah, shout out to whoever that that person is. I have an idea who it might be. Um, so, <laughs> fuck, I lost my point. God damn, Renaissance man, why'd you do it? <laughs> Wait, go ahead, D. You rapping? No, nah, my my bad, complex. I just I, he made a comment about something you said, and uh, yeah, yeah. No, um, no, th- th- this is. What, what, I, now is the time to strike while the iron is hot, man. They, they're on their back foot. Um, I'm speaking about those uh, in the dominant society. They're on their back foot. Apply pressure to them, man. Um, a lot of the ideas that I'm presenting here, I presented when I went to the continent, and they took those ideas, okay? They took those ideas, and they're expanding on them right now. So I, I talked to somebody earlier uh, before the live stream, and um, uh, they, you know, they gave me a status update on what they were doing over there with the ANC and whatnot. So. I know I know that um, what I'm saying is actually uh, 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 workable. It's 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 a, it's a proven concept, or it can be a proven concept um, when when funded. So you pull some funds from the IMF uh, to build a library, and, and, and you fu- you funnel those um, those funds into uh, in, in, into an incubator, and, and that's how you get your tech startups going. Okay, without actually uh, going broke it's not coming out of your pocket so and mike you're not and it's not like you're uh proposing something that is a uh sorry i was just sneezing here um it's not like you're proposing something that's some some wild idea or something no the incubator concept is something that has spawned a lot of companies that have spawned a lot of applications and products that we all use today Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, let me close out. Um, thank you all for joining us and please hit the like button if not already done so and share the video if possible. Hit the notification bell so you get all the updates from the Black Brain Trust Queen. Those posts on the community tab, we are being shadow banned at the moment. Um, shalom everyone. <laughs>